Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us. Uh, this is the first of our series of webinars we would like to do on, uh, we would be doing on the Brahmaputra. Uh, today, we are covering certain aspects right from uh, governance to climate change, to sustainability, to economic development. And again, next month also, we will ha be having a set of uh, experts and strategists talking about various aspects to start with i would like to uh, request himanshu shekhar das sir he has been the additional chief secretary of the government of assam before taking over as the chief information commissioner of the state <clears throat> he joined the ias in 1982 and has the distinction of being the longest serving state finance secretary during which he pioneered the financial restructuring and fiscal reforms process in Assam. Uh, I have been interacting with Sir for a while now, and he is extremely well read. And I think he has the advantage of being an Assamese uh, in the uh, Assam cadre of the IS. So his deep understanding of the state and with his uh, such a long experience, I thought there couldn't have been a better person to start this webinar. Uh, sir, uh, I would request you to make your opening remarks. Anup, thank you. Thank you very much. I really feel honored and privileged to give the opening remarks in this, you know, in this August company. As you have already said, I belong to the Assam cadre of the IES. I'm 1982 batch. There's a saying in Assamese, you know, like I mean, to, to measure distance, they said Dhubri to Sadia. That is, I mean, that is, Isaac, that is the longest distance in the world. And Dhubri is the end point where the Brahmaputra leaves Assam and enters Bangladesh. And Sadia is the beginning point where the Brahmaputra River enters the plains of Assam. And in the course of my service, I did have the opportunity of serving in both the places. I was district minister Dhubri. And before that, my first posting in the IS was as SDU civilian Sadia. Now, when you say Brahmaputra, normally what comes to mind is you know, like I mean, the Chanpu River originating in China, BRC and then passing through Arunachal Pradesh as Siang, then Dihang, and then becomes Brahmaputra. But if you go into the mythology, the Brahma, the son of Brahma, Brahmaputra, that actually this name of the river is linked not to Champo or Siang, but with the Lohit River. Brahmaputra, as you know, I mean, in Sadia subdivision where I was the SDO, the three main streams of the Brahmaputra River, they meet. The easternmost, um, uh, easternmost one is Lohit, that also, that also originates just across the border, India, India China border in China, but it, most of the part it flows to Lohit district of Arunachal Pradesh. And that is where the Prasuram Kunda is located and all the mythology that is associated with the river, Lohit, uh, Brahmaputra, Brahma Kunda is in Lohit river. Although that is much shorter than Champo. The middle river is Dibang. Dibang is also not a very long river, but a very ferocious river. That is the middle stream. And the other one, as you all know, the Champo river, I mean, Siang, it meets these three river meets at a point near Dhola, and then it becomes Brahmaputra. It's about 800 odd kilometers. It passes through Assam, and before that, as you all know, Tibet Autonomous Region in PRC, then Arunachal Pradesh, Assam, and Bangladesh. Now, historically, traditionally, Brahmaputra has been the lifeline of Assam, the Brahmaputra Valley mainly. And into Assam is civilization is basically it's a river valley civilization, just like most other civilizations of the world. From ancient times, Assam has been a river valley civilization. Even if you look at the I mean, cultural aspect, Dr. Bhupan Hajarika, for example, there's so many songs that he sang about the river, on the river, sometimes out of anger, he address the river to the river, you know. But today you find that you know, in the new generation, I mean, as if the Brahmaputra has is losing its importance in the social, cultural, and economic life of the state. In the new generation, you hardly ever hear a song sung on the Brahmaputra River, like Jubin Gag and Papan and all that. Hardly any song on Brahmaputra, not like Dr. Bhuban Ezekiel's time. Similarly, historically, Assam's connection with the outside world was to the river, to Bangladesh. When my, I used to hear from my grandfather and my father that even our forefathers used to go for trading along through Brahmaputra, through Australia, East Bengal, along the coast of Urisa, up to Andhra Pradesh, and places like that. But today, that maritime trade is also gone. And what is happening today is that, I mean, Rahmatullah River, people are talking about uh, uh, these dam, dams that have been constructed by China. 
in their territory. And as a response, we are also thinking about like Suwan City has already been dammed, Brahmaputra, Lohit, dams are coming up. And people are really worried about that. Is that are these dams going to kill the river? Or is, is it are they going to change its character? Yeah, I would like to just say one thing. Once I was in Dehradun Forest Academy, and I was surprised to know that in Ganga, after it crosses Haridwar and the Shivalik, 70% of the Ganges water is due to the you know, vegetation there. It's not, I mean, snow contributes, I mean, during the lean season, snow contributes, snow melting, snow contributes only about 30%. Remaining 70%, even when there are no rains, it's due to vegetation because of the, you know, the trees absorb the moisture from the atmosphere. Then through the roots, they secrete it and that flows as streams and then it becomes the river. I think I, the biggest danger more than, the, I mean, of course, these dams are, in, are definitely there of concern. But what I'm more worried is the deforestation. As we all know, the Siang River or the Shanpu doesn't contribute more than 30% of Brahmaputra's water at Pandu Gohati Point. Remaining 70% are contributed by Lohit, Dibang, and the other tributaries. But the most of these tributaries and Lohit and Dibang, they are not really snow, I mean snow fed, but to the deep forest, because of the deep forest and the I mean, secretion of water by the forest. What is worrying me is that the amount of deforestation that is going in the name of development in the catchment areas that may pose as big a threat to the river as the multiple dams that are coming up and i know you are from the defense or defense forces i know we had talked about it historically the river has been very important to assam even militarily two of the biggest battles assam history has ever seen one was in 1206 after conquering Bengal in 1205, Bakhtar Khilji he attacked Assam and their deed and Assam King Pitu, he defeated Bakhtar Khilji on the banks of Barnodi near Gohati. It's a big tributary of the Brahma River. That was in 1206 AD. That was Pitu versus Bakhtar Khilji, which were Pitu won handsomely. And the next big battle was again fought on the river. That was in the Battle of Sarai Ghat on 7th April in 1671, when Lashid Barfukan, the Assamese general, defeated the Mughal army led by Ramanujar Ram Singh of Amir. So today, Brahmaputra, as I said, you know, whether it is culturally, whether it is navigation and economically, or whether even militarily, I mean, as if somehow, you know, the river is basically becoming a more of a uh, think, kind of a worry because of the floods. And as you know, this topic today that you have said is basically climate change. Am I right? And this river. What is happening in the last uh, couple of decades, you have seen that the fluctuation in the water level and in the, in the river flow has become highly irregular. And that is, I mean, we definitely we can attribute it to climate change. For example, this year, this 2021, there was hardly any flood in the river, in, in the state and the Brahmaputra River. But sometimes untimely floods, untimely heavy rainfall, I mean, these are going, going to cause real, you know, like serious ecological damage and they are a matter of serious ecological concern. So this is, these are the areas what I will think is that you know, we need to take care of. And another very important aspect of Brahmaputra River is one of the experts who came to study the river. Well, I had interaction with him and he said, Mr. Das, it is not one river, it is two rivers. One is the surface, is the river of water and underneath there is the rolling river of sand. Rohokto is one river in the world which carries the, you know, like per cubic meter wise in the flow of water. It carries the highest density of sediments. And what is happening in the last 50 years after the great earthquake of 1950 is that it has become much wider than what it was in 1950 before the earthquake. It has become a very shallow river today for it's not fit for navigation in many parts. And it's become a highly braided river. You know, it's not one stream that one stream flows. It's so many streams, they, you know, some dries up in the winter, then again they come. They become a highly braided river. And as a result, we have more than 2,500 small or big river islands. Majuli, we all have heard of Majuli, is one of them, the biggest river island. But there are 2,500 other such river islands. So these are, I say, if I feel, you know, these are economic aspects, these are cultural aspects, they're also a defense aspects because it originates in one country and it leaves our country at Dubri Point and enters another neighboring country. So on both sides of it, definitely there is a security angle. So I think in today's webinar, today's seminar, we have so many experts 
will be able to throw more light into different aspects of the river, its ecological aspects, its ecological impact on the state and the country. So I wish you all now grand success to this webinar. And I thank you for taking this initiative, for taking this initiative, because I know the experts that you have collected, we all will benefit from their inputs and their views and insights. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. I think it's a very good start that you gave, uh, giving us the historical perspective and also the larger perspective. And as you said, sir, uh, we will be also working on a report post the webinar uh, as we do normally, and we'll be sharing with everybody. Uh, it will be available in our website as well. And uh, we'll try and connect with everybody who has been part of it and continue to seek their support and guidance going forward. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Welcome. Now, I would like to talk about the underwater domain awareness framework and a little bit of the thought process that went behind uh, doing this kind of a webinar. Uh, we are very happy to uh, see a whole lot of senior people who have joined us, uh, not just in the panel, but also in the audience. And we look forward to benefiting from their feedback uh, going forward. Uh, now, coming to the underwater domain awareness framework that we are looking at, uh, I thought that it is important because certain aspects of the UDA that uh, uh, we feel should be known to the larger uh, community, to the stakeholders and also to the policy maker. And that's how we thought it is important. And many times when we talk about UDA, people feel that it is only a security related issue and only the Navy or the Coast Guard is uh, kind of uh, responsible for it. But I would like to uh, okay, <clears throat> say that there are many aspects of the UDA which is important. And I think this Brahmaputra series would uh, just open up one uh, another dimension to that. I mean, the freshwater systems and a whole lot of things. Uh, so I'll try and cover certain aspects, geostrategic <clears throat> context, uh, India in the 21st century, what the underwater domain awareness is, uh, some of our efforts and what, uh, how we would like to co uh, contribute going, going forward. Uh, in the 21st century, I think we all must take note that the larger interactions that are happening, whether it is maritime or even geopolitical and geostrategic, is all in the tropical region. I mean, you can see the entire Indo-Pacific being talked about and uh, many other strategic uh, formulations. It's all about, and they, these uh, uh, regions, I mean, I'm not just talking about the water alone. Uh, these regions have very unique political, economic, and <coughs> military uh, uh, connotations. So we just need to uh, go through that and uh, appreciate before we plan our way forward. Uh, Indo-Pacific, as we keep hearing, it is the tropical waters of the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. So this has its own impact in the entire, uh, whether it is a governance mechanism that you talk about or any economic development that you want to talk about. We need to keep track of this tropical uh, conditions uh, or tropical uh, characteristics that we talk about. I mean, coming to, there are many experts uh, coming after me, so I will not dwell too much upon the Brahmaputra River as such. I will restrict myself to the UDA framework that we talk about. But just to justify why this uh, Brahmaputra uh, series we are doing, I mean, you can see the entire Brahmaputra basin and so many countries are uh, party to it. So the diplomacy angle is again very important. Security is, of course, very important as uh, Himanshu sir also mentioned. And there are so many more, I mean, uh, things that we need to look at. Uh, so <clears throat> I thought it's very important that we have diverse, I mean, you will see the diversity of the experts that we are going to have in this uh, webinar. Uh, so typically, we would like to talk about people, economy, and nature. Uh, people in many ways, I mean, socio-political, socio-cultural, socio-economic <coughs> uh, also, uh, because people have to be given the importance that it, they deserve. I mean, every aspect, I mean, whether it is water resource management, water quality management, a whole lot of issues come. Economic growth is inescapable. I mean, we talk about the I mean, when I say the Indo-Pacific, if you see population density and the population bulge is huge in this part of the world. And unless we can generate a, a significantly high economic uh, growth rate, I think the demographic advantage can become a huge demographic uh, uh, crisis. 
so how do we keep the economy going and keep people engaged meaningfully and of course when you are driving development or when you are driving the economic engines sustainability is something we can never forget so nature becomes very important i think there is a whole lot of attention but uh, one very important thing which i noticed while going through the literature is very few people understand the brahmaputra so it is very important that we have a focused study on the brahmaputra so that's why i think this kind of series become important india in the 21st century i think there's a lot of attention uh, which has come to the maritime domain or uh, i mean india has been accused in the navy we say india is uh, continental or sea blind uh, maritime has not got very uh, the attention that it deserves but i think the pri uh, prime minister has come up with the sagar vision but i would like to submit here that when we say the sagar it is not limited to the maritime alone it also addresses or it should if not uh, the uh, the uh, the freshwater systems the river basins i mean the whole lot of aspects that need to be covered under the sagar vision and one of the very uh, senior uh, diplomats mentioned that the sagar vision without the uda framework uh, would mean very little so in that sense again the underwater domain becomes very very important there are to support the sagar vision there are big announcements or the big mega projects uh, announced by the government the sagar mala and the inland water transport i think there is a whole lot of underwater component to it which all we all must understand the act is policy i think there is uh, i mean earlier it was look east in the 1991 and now in 2014 onwards the act is policy is being driven very very aggressively by the government so how do we complement that process uh, or that strategic view or vision is what we would be looking forward to northeast i think is getting the attention now probably there was a time when the northeast did not get the attention but i think there is a lot of attention by the government so i think people on the ground like us also need to come forward and contribute we must not forget the socio economic and the social cultural focus i mean uh, as himanshu sir also mentioned that there's a lot of traditional knowledge uh, which uh, exists and somehow we have forgotten that unless we take note of that and facilitate or empower that i mean i think technology or science and technology should not get arrogant to say that we can solve everything i think science and technology should be a enabler which kind of i mean the brahmaputra has been there for a long time the communities around the brahmaputra have been using the river or have been part of the whole river system for a long time and i think they have sorted out a whole lot of things what we can probably do today to scale up uh, we can empower that using science and technology so we should not miss the focus there and i think the capacity building and the capability building is something uh, which requires far more focus and far more aggressive intent uh, the river dolphin i think becomes one of the prime uh i mean why i am talking about this today in a very special way is that the river dolphins are a very unique creature that india has the freshwater dolphins are blind they depend on what is called acoustic vision so here again the underwater domain awareness becomes very important so sometimes in our drive to uh, have more and more development i mean the inland water transport is a huge project very critical for the growth and the development of the region but it also generates very high noise which is detrimental so when we say sustainability or even environmental impact assessment the acoustic habitat degradation also should be given enough uh, importance and a lot of work needs to be done there uh, so the conservation will will be more holistic uh, if the acoustic component is also take, given as much importance uh, i mean in the name of development i think the indian coast is seeing lot more such strandings i mean i've done a lot of reporting on uh, in the west coast uh, uh, and even the east coast the third one the picture that you see is of tuti korin first one is south of mumbai second one is karwar so uh, these strandings i mean in maharashtra coast alone in 2016 there were 80 80 st uh, big whale strandings in one year and just that 720 kilometers of maharashtra coast and many of these things don't get reported very well and i think uh, i mean when they don't get reported they don't get the attention that they deserve so i think lot more needs to be looked at uh, uh, when we talk about sustainability water resource management i think right now we are 20% short 
of water resources unless and rapid urbanization so called development i think uh, we may lose uh, the focus that uh, it deserves so water resource management has to be given significant attention uh, if we want to keep pace uh, in the long term uh, water quality management is equally uh, important i am giving a larger picture uh, india itself you know there are so much and with this corona or the pandemic period we also know that there is a possibility of sabotage i mean there could be a security angle also so how do we put mechanisms in place where we get a real time assessment of both re uh, water resource management and water quality management i mean these things are uh, today technology uh, enables us to do it in much cheaper way and much uh, but uh, unless there is a governance attention to it uh, we will miss the bus uh now i mean for anything water or underwater above water or even underwater i mean maritime uh, domain awareness is a term which uh, got very popular globally after the 911 and in the indian subcontinent after the 2611 but the worry is that this remained a security driven formulation where the participation by the other stakeholders was extremely limited uh, i mean there is hardly any capacity among the other stakeholders to take this forward so again as we say when we do not have the right solution then you try to use the wrong thing a uh, wrong tool for a certain uh, uh, issue so we need to give more focus to this and the whole maritime domain awareness remained very superficial and on the surface so the underwater part got extremely neglected uh, somebody may say that this is an american concept uh, but let me tell you the underwater domain awareness framework has been a uh, indigenous effort and i think mrc has been pioneering this just to give you a sense of what are the stakeholders security of course uh, today huge amount of disruptive technologies are available ai and robotics is now available to young kids who are extremely capable but imagine going uh, these things these capabilities going into the wrong hand or wrong side of the divide it can create havoc so i think we need to have a far better uh, framework uh, right from the policy intervention to technology intervention and capacity and capability building where we will we should be able to avert any kind of security threat and security has many dimensions i mean i think we will not go into the details of it sir has also mentioned few aspects uh, blue economy there is a whole lot of potential underwater uh, i mean whether it is food security energy security or uh, resources under uh, under sea or underwater i mean when we are talking about brahmaputra so again capacity building our ability to be able to see below the water and i think a better domain awareness will allow you to steer or maneuver sustainability uh, through the development also i mean coming more closer you can see sir has mentioned there are inland water transport huge mega projects and the siltation of brahmaputra loses 4000 meters after it enters india the river flow is very high the siltation rates are very high uh, people have been doing dredging but i think there are far better solutions to minimize the siltation and otherwise it becomes unsustainable to try and keep the waters navigable just by dredging so i mean we have been doing these studies how sedimentation or sediment management can be done in a better way even water resource management when you look at it most of our dams are silted so the capacity is reduced and both ways it is a problem i mean whether for drought management or for flood management Uh, there are a whole lot of resources available with better uh, domain awareness we can i think make it more effective and efficient uh, you can see a whole lot of i mean environmental aspects i have talked about acoustic habitat degradation even disaster management uh, can be done much better i mean i can't say that you can stop a disaster from happening but definitely with early warning systems in place you can do a much more better management i mean the loss of life and property can be minimized uh some of the pictures just to you know give you a sense of the spectrum of things that are, get covered under the uda thing i mean lot more study on the dolphins is very very important and many of these studies can actually be an indicator for various other sustainability issues uh 
how do you drive science and technology into it i mean how can we bring more and more science and technology for achieving a real time monitoring of the underwater situation that's something important lot of ai and robotics can be used here uh, i mean i say uh, to see to understand and to share so better sensors better platforms whole lot of work is required to be done and it requires an integrated approach i mean uh, the way we are fragmented among the stakeholders unless we come together Uh, we will not be able to kind of take this forward and this is the framework we have proposed and this is definitely our uh, proposal where all the four stakeholders can come together uh, pool in resources and synergize their effort you can see the horizontal construct all the four faces represent the four stakeholders but the core will remain the acoustic capacity and capability building uh, i mean important thing here is that we have been importing technology from outside but the tropical water most of these technologies have been developed during the cold war period in the temperate and the polar region the performance degradation of a sonar which is deployed for any of these purpose is of the order of 60% so you can imagine that that technology has very little relevance here so unless we focus on indigenous technology development and also site specific uh, local field experimental work i don't think we will achieve what we want to achieve so all the stakeholders need to uh, i mean we are developing countries we cannot prioritize uh, so much for technology i mean socio economic uh, issues are equally important so unless we come together and i think there are many smarter ways of uh, uh, taking care of our uh, concerns for data security and putting that all together and also when we talk about policy many times we Im even import policy from outside and that just doesn't work in our condition so how do we do i mean if you look at the vertical construct how do we mo do more and more data sensing uh, application specific analysis and then uh, policy i mean it has to be a bottom up approach rather than the top down approach so lot more sensing is required then only we'll be able to achieve uh, a customized solution to our problems otherwise it will be a, a futile effort to take uh, i mean to bring this forward uh, just to uh, give it a i mean uh, i mean uda is huge there are so many aspects to it just to give you one example underwater radiated noise the inland water transport is a huge project now uh, there has to be i mean certain uh, environmental impact the noise from the ships uh, or the uh, vessels that will be put in the water will have uh, impact on the freshwater dolphin that we hihu as we call it in our lo local language it, there, there's huge impact on the uh, uh, the dolphin uh, but how do we steer this how can we make the noise uh, within a certain limit so uh, then I mean, from a security perspective also and like in the navy we call it acoustic stealth for an environmental perspective it will be acoustic habitat degradation and right at the ship design and ship uh, building stage itself if you are conscious of this it is not going to i mean many times people fear that it is going to add to the cost uh, we had a paper in the international maritime organization this uh, last year uh, where we have built up this solution and where uh, it can give us a complete back backing for Uh, effective policy intervention technology intervention and capacity building i mean you will have a real time picture of how it is go, uh, uh, going and we can take care of many things similarly sediment management as i said i mean many stakeholders needed whether it is res water resource management or even the inland water transport so if all these bodies can come together pool in resources for a local site specific r&d i think lot more can be achieved and uh, we will have a real time perspective so even the operations can be managed much better uh, i mean navigation uh, will be a major issue uh, various other aspects are there so all this can be managed in real time and even it will give you significant input for policy uh, intervention also uh, we have built this user academia industry partnership there are uh, multiple government of india schemes which can be uh, dovetailed into this and there are certain core areas which can be put together and we can drive this entire governance mechanism in a very very effective manner so i'll not go into the details of it but you can see various stakeholders can benefit out of this whole thing because underwater is required for everybody i mean there is a whole lot of oil and gas industries involved in that area inland water transport is a big project water resource management of course flood management and a whole lot of things how all of them can come together and build this up uh, is something we can work together on
this is one of the examples I would like to give you. Uh, the AIS automated identification system and the counterpart to that is the river information system, which is being there. The data which is being generated by that can be so easily used for uh, building these real time maps. This gives you a complete underwater domain awareness. How to deploy any kind of underwater equipment can be easily. Uh, I mean, a real time assessment can be achieved from this. This can a similar thing can also be used for any kind of uh, acoustic survey uh, required for whatever for whether it is navigational purpose or any other purpose. So uh, many such things can be done, and the whole start startup ecosystem can also be kind of boosted uh, using such things. Uh, even say water quality management can also be driven from there. Uh, we have to have focus for the riverine communities, and there are a whole lot of things that can be done for them. Just that we need to put them into a framework and uh, with a good focus on the community also. I mean, how enhancement of livelihood can be looked at. Uh, these are the three dimensional maps that we have because the conditions, the tropical waters, uh, they have very unique characteristics. So there is a lot of technology that is available today, just that we need to customize it to our requirement. And you can see different seasons have a very different behavior. So all that can be put together and a three dimensional uh, appreciation of what is happening below the surface of the water can be generated for various purposes. It is not limited to one or two, but uh, as you saw, even, I mean, we have done this work for shrimp uh, farming, but similar things, I mean, fisheries will become an area because local communities depend on these resources. So how do we bring it to, and it has to be made accessible to them. It has to be made easy for them to be able to use it. They are definitely now getting better and better technology savvy. But I think a bit of hand holding is still required. So, uh, I mean, you can see these kind of maps, which gives you a, uh, and what will happen is these uh, farmers uh, can get far better financial support. We are also working on those kind of models. Uh, if there is little more uh, certainty in their whole practices. So this whole digital, uh, I mean, I use the word digital ocean in the maritime thing, but a digital underwater framework will definitely add a lot of value. This will bring a lot more certainty to their operation. And so the financial models will become much easier. Uh, so MRC has been pushing this UDA framework. We've got some recognition. Some of our innovations have got recognized globally. Some of our defense technologies have got uh, globally recognized. We have some publications also. Uh, Niti Ayog has now given us uh, a project for national policy. Uh, the NSA's office also has been kind and uh, working with us. Uh, so a larger uh, framework and a larger participation is, I think, important. And I seek everybody's support in taking it forward. Uh, we have developed certain academic programs approved by AICT. We have some skilling programs which can get, uh, I mean, the young people into it. Young India can benefit a whole lot from there. And <clears throat> I think the digital uh, ocean or digital river will have its relevance in terms of better governance mechanism. So I think I will not go into the details of this. We do these summer schools every year. We now uh, have very bright students coming to us and working on different projects. Apart from the project, we also give them a whole lot of exposure to various organizations for their career uh, uh, opportunities and also the technology exposure and what are the, you know, you always have to be on the sunrise sector. So I would say the UDA or the water is the sunrise sector. So they should look at it very seriously. So we get the best of people who you can see the Goa chief minister, former naval chief, uh, director of National Institute of Oceanography, whole lot of people come and every year we've been doing it. Uh, we also do field work. I mean, Khadakwasta Lake, we have done a sediment uh, management workshop where Field data was collected and one of my PhD students work, but uh, this was a very good uh, confident building uh, for everybody. I mean, some 25 people had participated and the data, it was a, almost a three year effort uh, in terms of plan planning and execution, but the actual data collection was done for a week. So I would propose a outreach, engage and sustain model for taking this forward. Outreach is these kind of webinars and seminars. Engage is we identify certain stakeholders and policy makers, uh, develop a one-to-one -one en uh, engagement with them. And to sustain, we pick up some projects. We are now lucky we have uh, got some partners with us. But going forward, we look forward to connecting with many more people. And probably a center of excellence uh, would make a lot of sense. 
where we have multidisciplinary research center, an incubation center, a scaling center, or a leadership center, uh, academic center where even degrees can be. I mean, we already have approvals from the AICT, but a lot more can be done, and a policy center. All this put together in under one roof, but having their own key uh, performance indicators, and we can take it forward. So thank you so much. I think I seek all your support uh, in taking this forward and participation going forward. <clears throat> so uh, now <clears throat> we have another very eminent uh, person, Dr. Arup Mishra, sir, chairman of the Assam Pollution Control Board. Uh, sir has been <clears throat> the director of the ASTEC. The Assam Science and Technology and Environment Council and also the Assam Energy Development Agency, a chemical engineer by training. He joined the Assam Engineering College as a lecturer and received his master's degree from IIT Kanpur in heavy metals, water <coughs> pollution. Uh, post teaching in AEC for 24 years, he went to the Department of Science and Technology. And since then, <coughs> he's been contributing significantly to uh, science and technology and also uh, Sam in a big way. So I have interacted with Sir as Director Aztec and he has been extremely kind to support us in as many ways possible. Uh, sir, your turn please. Thanks at the outset, uh, Dr. Arnab Das, for inviting me. But uh, the type of uh, feeling I had when I was in uh, Aztec Science and Council, I think I don't have the same uh, type of uh, feeling or enthusiasm today sitting here an organization where I joined three months back and uh, as an outsider teaching in the college or as director in SND council, I had a lot of uh, complaints against the pollution control board. And today I'm heading the board. Nevertheless, I'll try to uh, keep your request and uh, present a little bit the water quality management perspective. Definitely the pollution control board of any state is the custodian of the quality of water, air, uh, soil, everything. So from that point of view, this is the like uh, for the people who are not from Assam. Uh, let me tell you that uh, this river, without the river, we cannot think of any Assam, any state of Assam or the population. Foundation of all our agriculture, fisheries, drinking water industries and whatever we do is dependent upon this river. You can see just a sketch of uh, the river flow, how it is coming from uh, Dihang, Dimong, and Rohit. Three streams coming from Arunachal side and then coming to joining in Khodia with a huge fall. So from there, more than 700 kilometers it is flowing and coming to Bangladesh where they call Jamuna. It's a massive system and therefore we don't call Brahmaputra as a state or national river. It's an international river. You can see from the autonomous region of Tibet and uh, Yalong Zhangbo, China, like that it has come to, and finally it is going to the Bay of Bengal. So just for your information, I know all of you are present here, you are very much aware about the river, but still roughly the statistics, it's length of three, eight, four, eight kilometer, uh, Depth of 30 meter average and maximum is 125 meter. I uttered the name, so dear. River is prone to catastrophic flooding in the spring when Himalayan snow melts. Average discharge of the river is, you can imagine, 19,800 meter cube per second. And floods reach up to 100,000 meter cube per second. So, Brahmaputra is a classic example of heavy discharge. It's an example of braided river and susceptible to channel migration and avulsion. It is also one of the few rivers in the world that exhibits a tidal bore. It's navigable for most of the length, but we have not been able to utilize the navigation facilities to the extent possible. Only few ferries or boat put is running between two different towns or cities in uh, Assam is not the navigation. If one goes to the history of Assam, the way from uh, West Bengal, Kolkata, how ships used to come to Assam and even now uh, when required it comes, all the heavy machineries of the different industry units in Assam are uh, transported through the ship, but it has not been used to the best possible extent. One reason what Ornab was speaking earlier, I find is that because of the siltation, 
silt has made uh, something very difficult and unless you have a clear two meter draft in the river water draft or two, 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 two meter normally navigation is not uh, recommended for heavy ships so uh, this is sitting as a as a person in the pollution control board uh, whatever little bit of uh, work i have done uh, in different capacities earlier also before here compared to what i see in uh, ganga yamuna godavari mahanadi etc we are still very much clean in the sense that it is high volume discharge of water is very heavy the pollutants don't stay for a long time bermuda has remarkable self purification self cleansing capabilities therefore high dispersion and dilution also is there compared to the rest of the country industrialized areas our establishments are much less when when some people talk to me i normally tell that uh, what industries you can have you can count in your fingertips those industries four refineries couple of petrochemical complexes couple of fertilizer manufacturing industries and then all small small or medium type of industries mostly which are service type trading type but manufacturing is quite few now of course in the last couple of years we have seen that uh, number of people coming forward to establish industries in various sectors whether it is core sector or it sector is increasing and most of the industrial houses also big houses are also trying to bring some of their facilities out in assam and the northeast whatever may be the river passes through a uh, place a state where comparatively forget about guwahati city or some few cities like dubri etc but otherwise the river passes through the places small small villages and towns where population density as compared to india is very less so this is these are the things that because of that only still rohaputra is uh, manageable not uh, become totally you know uh, degraded like uh, yamuna or ganga in many places but this is not something to rejoice after this past slide immediately i would like to bring to your notice problems are emerging very fast in many sectors and uh, here from our laboratories and our all our affiliated regional centers we have nine uh, pollution control board centers in assam in various places we call them ro's regional office whatever physical chemical bacteriological studies have been done either by some other organizations or by our own laboratory we find that waste management waste disposal is becoming a very pro big problem and therefore this uh, coliform bacterial strains are becoming very heavy in many places then sometimes there are some seasonal activities like idol immersion puja religious festival like chhot puja was recently there durga puja was there in spite of the pollution control board and the government giving lot of notifications that chemicals cannot be used heavy metals cannot be used even then you find that idols are being made and all these type of materials which are non biodegradable are thrown in the river third point is the most critical point and i have been taking it very very seriously after i joined in many of the public meetings and interviews i have said that air pollution water pollution no doubt are very critical but this 3.3 crore population of assam everybody creating some waste some plastics or other pla other waste and sewage this is a very very critical issue and we are performing much below par i am very sorry to say there is forget about other places even guwahati doesn't have very good quality of sewage treatment plants or effluent treatment plants and therefore entire water dirty water is going to all the streams small, small streams nalas and from there it goes to the river parapatra so this is a very serious problem for us and we have to attack it of course now the coming of after coming of national green tribunal and uh, frequent supreme court directives all pollution control boards are taking very serious measures but then it is not something that 250 people sitting in the offices can do something if the people don't come into uh, the fold with us deforestation upstream and construction activities contributed to huge silt and soil load in river floods increasing due to raised river beds no denial about the fact honorable so mentioned about the silt load along with solid waste the menace of hazardous waste and biomedical waste also posing great threats to the water quality last two years have seen unprecedented rise in biomedical waste after the covid care centers and all the hospitals nursing homes full of covid patients 
lot of hundreds and thousands of testing going on for rat or rt pcr so you can imagine what is the condition and we in guwahati near guwahati there is a place called panikhaiti only one biomedical waste uh, like uh, treatment trip unit is there incinerator is there who is taking care of the entire middle assam and lower assam area so it is a very very unfortunate situation of course recently in the last week only we have uh, given clearance to another uh, company for setting up a biomedical waste unit in borpeta lower assam which will be contributing to nalbari borpeta dhubri gualpara bongaigaon all these btr areas etc uh, so these are some of the serious problems of course government has also tried its best to set up this bm waste uh, facilities in the medical colleges but only setting up of some instrumental equipment doesn't suffice you need to have trained manpower you need to have a regular monitoring you need to have proper calibration of the equipment then only the whole thing will be successful the most serious factor today is with the increase in population and productivity everyone talks about producing producing more producing more from the same land therefore as a chemical engineer i know how what type of pesticides and what agrochemicals fungicides algae sites you know pesticides all are going into huge quantity without training farmers are using it and sometimes not sometimes most of the times these agrochemicals are used much above the limit so they are just washed out by rain or other things and they go to the nearby drains and find their way to the river brahmaputra every river is unique dear friends and is a key principle to management you cannot take any river somewhere in europe or america and do some modeling in brahmaputra is very very unique type in things the blue uh, bullets you can see what are the inputs received by a river system like brahmaputra number one is atmospheric inputs of materials number two is the degradation of terrestrial organic matter and three is the weathering of surface rocks so all these three they contribute somehow to the river becoming you know uh, through soil and porous rocks they go on their way they are affected by numerous processes like recycling terrestrial biota recycling and storage in soils exchange between dissolved and particulate matter and so on and so forth so in a sense i can say river studying the river hydrology hydro dynamics and also the chemistry part of it the chemistry or biochemical part of it is very very important sometimes we do a lot of mistakes in designing something in the river or some projects with the river like brahmaputra where we fail to actually take the following points which i gave in the last paragraph uh, this is very very important so those things are also part of our principles of management and now in the pollution control board assam uh, we have made a dedicated team of scientists and engineers to especially look into these matters why i am telling you just now you know these are some of the environmental factors controlling river chemistry i don't want to Uh, highlight too much on here rather i would like to go to the situation that assam is facing today okay ah this is interesting during january 2016 and december 17 central pollution control board identified 44 river station assam based on the bod value assessed during this particular period uh, bod is biochemical oxygen demand or people sometimes call biological oxygen demand so after maharashtra 57 stretches in assam was number 2 with 44 river states which is supposedly very very dirty polluted the brahmaputra river as a whole was also identified as a polluted river as per cpc studies i still remember after 2017 when the report came out a lot of people say that other parts of the country they have so many different rivers but how come brahmaputra with such a huge you know volume and uh, you know water discharge of water can be so polluted as you have made out but basically this is all because of the bod value which is not because of industrialization or heavy uh, economic activities but because of the sewage or you know solid waste etc people are throwing indiscriminately in the river and the river stretches then ngt passed an order uh, the uh, order was uh, for uh, for asking us pcba to give a proposal the proposal was given it has been approved by cpcb this is much before i came back now pcb took up the matter in right spirit and urgent basis today 35 of these river stretches are out of the polluted list but nine river stretches are some still exist in the list like uh, borolu in uh, assam here so uh, you can just i can just run through if time permits uh, this is very small screen uh, can you help me yes please 
So you can see here, uh, priority one, like that priority one, top priority, Morulu, Borsola, Sin Sako and Guwahati, priority two is Sorusola, priority three is Kamalpur, Deportville, Digboy River, Pansnoi, priority four is Kharsang, Brahmaputra, Pagladia, five is Buridegin, Disang, Borbil, like that. You know, so you will get here on the right hand side, uh, last column you will find, wherever there is written priority one, two, three, four, like that, nine stretches are shown. Pachnoi was originally polluted as per CPCB report. Now in 2021, 2022 now, it is supposed to be non-polluted. Like that, because of the work done and people's participation, we somehow could uh, like uh, bring 35 out of this list. 35 out of the list. Now presently, list of monitoring stations we have. These are the monitoring stations we have. And... Uh, some stations are there, like River uh, Brahmaputra in Dibrugar, Pandu, Jaji in uh, Jorhat National Highway Crossing, Dhonsiri in Golagat, because Dhonsiri is on the, uh, Dhonsiri's bank is an Omoligar refinery limited. It is going for three times expansion. Very soon, the 3 million metric ton refinery will become 9 million metric ton. And also, in the same campus, just outside the refinery complex, they are going to have a uh, bio refinery. Uh, methanol produced from bamboo. So, like that, uh, please remove this screen. Come to the main presentation. So, like that, uh, presently, our board is working on this uh, Maijan, Bogibil, Nimatigat, Vishwanath, Tenokhana Pahar near Tejpur, Chuanakuchi, Chandrapur, Kosarigat, in Guwahati, Pandu, Jogikupaya, Dhubri. 11 stations are right now here. You may ask me why every 11 in such a big state of Assam. I can tell you that now proposal has been made and we are very seriously thinking that we are going to increase this time because under national water monitoring plan, whatever has been done was not sufficient to take care of the whole state. So instead of 11 monitoring locations, we are going to increase it by at least three to four times in the immediate future. Our strategy is now manifold and inclusive. Number one, you can say extensive testing and monitoring of river stretches, adopting corrective measures. Number two is regulating use of water by industries, adoption of green practices, water harvesting. Wherever we have gone, we have always told them, and many industries are abiding also, whether it is a state or national level industry or big industrial house, they are always abiding by this uh, water recycling and water harvesting. So now the problem lies with the general people and the whole lot of people staying in the complexes. Guwahati has probably 1,000 plus residential complexes, what we call the apartment buildings. And these are the problem areas we are facing here. Neither they are going to shell out extra money for any facility, nor they are going to segregate the waste and give to us or the municipal corporation. So now some innovative measures have to be taken to bring people into our uh, ambit and then uh, do something like this. So we have taken up a comprehensive campaign for Bahaputra by creation of awareness for prevention of waste disposal dumping prevention of tree filling on the bank of Brahmaputra, since we are also part of the forest department, Minister, Department of Forest and Environment, Government of Assam. Therefore, uh, we have a good tie up with them. So we have uh, recommended for uh, taking some measures on tree filling on the Brahmaputra banks or creating alternative agricultural practices not to affect their livelihood. Then scientific eco-friendly ways to prevent flood and erosion and improve current flood taming measures. I'm sure after me, Partho is there from Aranak, he will speak on that. Uh, Arnab also mentioned about early warning system. Partho and their group already in Arunak, they have developed early warning system, flood early warning system and used in practice also. I have seen that. So like that, we are trying to develop uh, interest on people about loss of biodiversity, declining species, use of extensive electronic media. Very soon we will be in the internet, Twitter, handle, Facebook, etc. All job has been done. We have developed an app for P PCB. It was not there for the last 45 years. We didn't have any app. Now you can download the app and uh, from Google Play Store and definitely give your mind to us. So basically, we are now operating in four domains, industrial pollution control, monitoring of environment, waste management, which is a very serious matter, research activities, advisory to the government. I would not like to show you details of all these things. Uh, it is not required. The greatest threat to our planet is the belief that someone else will save it. Robert Swan, this uh, quotation, I love it very much. He has been always telling this. 
There's a lot of good, interesting uh, study he has done. So he says that consume wisely, manage your waste, stop open burning or garbage, including foliage, use fewer chemicals, choose reusable over single use materials, walk, bike or go for carpool. I've been trying to say this whenever I go to school, I always talk about carpool or biking or cycling, use less water, recycle properly and conserve electricity because every every kilowatt of electricity produced is equivalent to one kilogram of carbon dioxide released to the atmosphere. This is a very simple fact we all know, but sometimes we tend to forget when it comes to real life. So dear friends, it is the worst of times, but it is the best of times because we still have a chance. Earth still has a chance. Although we have exceeded the Earth's capacity, carrying capacity by manifold, almost 1.68 times more than one. You, you need actually 2.68 Earth today to sustain your normal life and practices that you have been doing. So unless we do that, your COP26 or all the COPs before that or the Paris Agreement, December 2015, all will be futile unless we really take care of uh, so all these things. So right now, uh, I am sure that uh, no pollution control board is very much liked by people. Common people and industry, nobody likes because they think it's a policing authority. But soon you will see that there is a facelift of pollution control board Assam. We are trying to work with people, with students, with youth, with NGOs and everyone uh, to make it more environment friendly, make it more people friendly and more accessible to all of you. So uh, I do not know. I am not an expert of underwater domain studies. Yes, Ornab rightly said, Aztec was part of a big conference held in the administrative staff college Khanapara a couple of years back. That is the first time I met this uh, gentleman. And uh, since then, we have been talking on and off. So I do not know. But from my side, from the pollution of Brahmaputra, whatever is there, I can tell you, it is not as worse as Kodavari, Narmada, Tista, or Yamuna, or uh, Ganga, but it is not uh, like uh, negligible as well. But we are taking real measures and we'll do it very soon. You will get the Brahmaputra back into its normal shape. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. It was extremely comprehensive and I think you've been very, very candid and you give us a lot of hope uh, going forward and we all uh, commit to you that we would like to contribute and be part of this whole sure, journey. Sure, yeah. Thank you, thank you so much, sir. Uh, now I have another very scholarly uh, <coughs> panelist, uh, Dr. Anamika Barua, is a professor at the mm -hmm. Department of Humanities and Social Sciences at the Indian Institute of Technology, Guwahati. Trained in ecological economics, her research interest lies in the understanding how political, social, and economic factors shape environmental decisions and change particularly related to water. She has published peer-reviewed articles in several leading international journals and have recently started her podcast on Brahmaputra, Voices of Brahmaputra. Uh, Anamika, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, I'm aware of your academic credentials and research credentials. And uh, we hope to benefit and we hope uh, to have your participation, not just in the webinar, but going forward. Thank you for joining us. Your time, please. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Arna, for inviting me here. And, uh, and and it was really good to hear so many eminent speakers before I spoke. Of course, I know Mr. Mishra and the good work he's putting in. and really happy to actually have him on the Pollution Control Board because now I just sent all my students to him to get data, which always used to be a big problem. But since he is from an academic background, so he understands how important it is. So yeah, so very nice to be in this whole, um, in, in this to be a part of this panel where everybody understands the river so well. And the best part is that everybody has already given a good background. <coughs> Um, my job, as you have assigned, Arnab, is to speak about uh, the impact of climate change on this um, particular river basin. Um, so, like you mentioned, we will. I mean, I'm trying to take it uh, from where we have discussed so far. A little, uh, I would say, different in the sense, bringing some of the work that we have done and which basically shows uh, more from a climate change perspective this whole Brahmaputra River Basin. And uh, let me also uh, tell you that my work on the Brahmaputra Basin actually started from 2013 onwards. Um, although I, my work was on water, but my, my specifically my work started to focus on Brahmaputra Basin uh, from 2013. 
2013. And that was a time when we actually initiated a project, which is which was a water diplomacy project. In you have diverse views, you can have a multidisciplinary approach. And bad is that if one sex stakeholder feels that he or she is left out, obviously there will be conflict. So that's how I think the river is also at the moment. Um, so what I plan to speak about today is just uh, to set the context is I want to open up the, the discussion on climate change and the Northeast as a whole, because the river flows through the Northeast. And, and, and then relating it with the kind of commitment India has in terms of climate change and how this river basin, which includes both the river basin from the point of view of mitigating climate change and adaptation to climate change, how can we actually look at this river basin? And then maybe some of the things that you all have been already discussing as uh, putting it as a way forward. Uh, to start with, I, I would really like to initiate the discussion with this particular framework. And it's a very interesting framework, which was given by the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change in 2014, and which actually calls climate change as climate risk. So we don't really call it anymore a climate as climate change. We have put it under a framework, which is a climate risk framework. And if you look at this risk framework, what it basically talks about that the climate change usually increases the risk of any system that we are talking about. And this risk is a function of three very important component, that is hazard. And hazard is something which is, for example, uh, any kind of natural or human induced physical event. It could be floods, drought, uh, you know, landslide, etc. Given that hazard, we need to understand who is exposed to that hazard. So that's where the exposure component comes in. And then we also need to understand that everyone who is exposed to this hazard may not be equally vulnerable. There is where this whole differentiated vulnerability concept comes in. So it's very important for us to also understand who is actually vulnerable to these risks given the hazard and exposure. And these concepts are very closely connected to uh, adaptation and mitigation as well. When we are talking about reducing the hazard, we are actually talking about mitigating it, mitigation effort. When we are talking about enhancing adaptive capacity, we are mostly focusing on the vulnerability aspect and try to see how do you reduce the impact of climate change on systems, different systems, including socioeconomic um, uh, system. And, and this framework is the framework which is now mostly used when, as, a, as an academician, we are trying to understand um, climate change impact. Now, the, the point is, why do we really need to worry about Assam or Northeast when we talk about climate change? And as has been mentioned earlier, it always looks like that, you know, Assam and Northeast as a whole is really very doing very well from every aspect because it's really, I mean, there's, there's a lot of greenery around. We have a lot of water. Somewhere we are living in a kind of uh, world where it looks like from outside that it's full of abundance. But is it really so? And that's what actually worries me. Because sometimes we, I think we take it too casually because we don't, we have yet not seen the, uh, you know, issues which are there and, and we are still in a denial phase and unless we accept it, I think uh, it's going to be difficult for us to uh, move ahead. So let me just start with this, uh, this risk framework where I just define that it's a function of hazard exposure and vulnerability. And if you look at from the point of view of Assam or Northeast, do we have hazards? Of course, we have landslides, we have floods, we have droughts. All of these are the hazards which are recurring hazards. What about what about uh, exposure? We all know that there is we, we, our infrastructure is weak. We have high concentration of poverty. And when I'm talking about poverty, I'm not really talking about income poverty. It's mostly like a multidimensional poverty where you see even, you know, access to good health, access to good education. All of these makes you, uh, you know, is now defined as poverty. We also depend a lot of climate on climate sensitive, uh, you know, livelihood. And so, you know, like agriculture, forestry, water, these are very important uh, component and which actually are highly exposed uh, to climate change. Then talking about vulnerability, there are two kinds of vulnerability, biophysical and socioeconomic. And if you look at it biophysically, also we are vulnerable and of course, socioeconomic as well, because the multidimensional nature of poverty keeps our capacity to adapt to any change low. And so given this, if you look at the kind of exposure we are into, I would say that we are actually doubly exposed to climate change. 
both biophysically as well as socioeconomic. There are hazards, there are exposure, and we are vulnerable too. If we are in a situation where hazards are high, but we have high capacity to adapt, then I think we are still better off. But in our case, we have hazards and we are also vulnerable. So that's where the concern is, and that's why we can't actually overlook the impact of climate change. I would like to also connect the climate change discussion with the sustainable development goals. And I think this is very important because these are not different things. If you look at all of these goals that the, the country has to achieve, but country can only achieve if states are at par, I mean, if states are achieving them. Now, if you look at all of these goals, it very clearly indicates that, you know, climate change will have an impact of all, all of these goals. It will enhance, in, it will increase poverty, it will increase hunger, it will also lead to gender inequality, it may also have issues on clean water and sanitation, uh, you know, economic growth, all of these indicators that we see here will have an impact due to climate change. And if you look at the, uh, you know, the latest um, data related to where India is in terms of SDG goals and performance of Northeast, you can see Northeast and in, in particularly Assam is not doing well in several indicators, for example, SDG 3, good health and well-being. It is uh, aspirant. It is not even a performer. Quality education, interestingly. And if you look at climate action, we haven't really done much. In industry, innovation, infrastructure, entire Northeast is red. Inequality, although we are comparatively better compared to Arunachal, but still uh, we need to do a lot there. And if you look at gender inequality, it seems it's very strange. Whole country, but even Northeast is not doing well. So given this, um, you know, background. If you if you look at this, these are very important indicators of development. On the other hand, we also have issues of uh, climate impact. So, given these two, you can see that we have a lot to do. It's not just about mitigating climate change; it is also about adapting to the changes that is uh, happening. Uh, just very briefly, we had. So just very briefly, we had that uh, recent study, and this was done uh, along with IIT Mandi and IISC Bangalore. And to our surprise, when we did a vulnerability mapping, it was a pan-India vulnerability exercise we carried out. Again, if you look at Assam and the Northeast, particularly Assam, we found a large number of districts to be highly vulnerable, ranking between 1 to 25. And these were the indicators which were mostly development indicators, assuming that the state is already hazard prone and there are large section of population exposed. So vulnerability seems to be very high. So given this background, why again we have more reasons if you look at the IPCC 2015 and also the IPCC 2021 report, it basically talks about that the risk from flood, water insecurity, rural livelihoods, all of this is going to be highly impacted due to climate change now. There will be loss of ecosystems, biodiversity losses, ecosystem goods and services will be affected. There is also uh, uh, you know, concerns related to health, disruptive livelihood, floodings or, or, or extreme events are going to go up. All of these are something that we really need to worry. And I heard Arnab speaking about disaster. So which means that a state like Assam has a lot more to worry. Disasters are only going to increase. And so we need to focus how do we look into the climate change impact, the river basin, the state as a whole. Um, so the question is, can we avoid climate change? Of course, no. We know that it is already happening. Can we reduce climate change? Yes, through mitigation. And can we reduce the impact through adaptation? So before I move in, there is sometimes I do see there is a lot of confusion between mitigation and adaptation. So I thought let me just very quickly um, give this uh, slide. So when we talk about mitigation, in a nutshell, we are actually trying to reduce the GHG emission. So when you talk about COP26 and this whole discussion about moving from non to renewable source of energy and the hydro power as one of the source of energy, we are actually talking about mitigation, particularly from the Brahmaputra uh, Basin perspective. When you talk about adaptation, here we are talking about all those basin communities who need to also adapt to these changes which is happening drastically, uh, the agriculture community, the community whose livelihood depends, for example, on water. So these two needs to go hand in hand. We can't look at only mitigation and forget about adaptation. 
nor we can only focus on adaptation and don't look at uh, mitigation. And when you talk about mitigation, and this is where the COP21 and COP26 uh, thing comes in, um, where I think we all know that India has made a huge commitment. One of the most important commitment here is that we plan to move away from uh, fossil fuel energy sources and we move more towards a uh, renewable source of energy. On the other hand, we are also saying that we want to increase the uh, carbon sink, which means we have to ensure that we don't go for a forest. I mean, we don't go for deforestation. We need more forests to ensure that there are enough uh, carbon sink. And this, although is a voluntary commitment, but this commitment is something that we have made in public and it is renewed. We can, it will be renewed whether we are, I mean, reviewed whether we are uh, kind of sticking to our commitments or not. And the last latest 20, COP26 commitment is something about where India actually announced that the net zero, which means that the balance between how much we are emitting and how much we are removing will become zero would be 2070. Now, of course, 2070 is far behind what the whole world wants to achieve with net zero by 2050. But even to achieve 2070, I'm going to show you in the next slide how much effort needs to go in. And that's where hydropower comes to be, becomes a very important uh, uh, you know, component. So this is the ambition. So if you look at the chart to the left side, the gray one is where we are right now. And we have to reduce coal to that extent. We have to increase solar. We have to increase wind. We have to increase hydro. Hydro is given very less because of a lot of issues, which is what I'm going to discuss again. So there is a lot that need to do. And most important thing is energy mix. We can't really only focus on one source of energy, even if it is renewable. And again, if you look at the other end, you see that we still depend a lot on a coal. Coal is continues to be a major source of energy. Um, there are issues, there are debates. Why is it so? Why is India, India changed that, uh, you know, phasing out and phasing uh, down and all of these things because uh, uh, the sector depends, uh, uh, the coal sector depends, um, um, uh, I mean, actually provides a huge amount of revenue and also livelihood. So you can phase out, but you can't just do away with it tomorrow. You have to have a very good concrete plan to, uh, to, to, to actually move from coal, move away from coal. Coming to the Brahmaputra Basin, already this basin has been described. So what I, how, how we look, we can look at this river basin is that, you know, there's a lot, uh, it's still missing in this river basin. Of course, floods, erosion, sedimentations are major challenges. We are yet, uh, you know, struggling with it. There are interstate disputes also. I mean, at times we talk about international cooperation, but if you really look at India, uh, Assam and Arunachal, and you make them sit together, I think there's a lot of discussion, dialogues needs to happen even between these two states. Water infrastructure development, there's a lot of potential, be it hydropower or be it irrigation, because this is also connected to water, food, energy nexus, but we all know that we are not really moving uh, or doing much as of now. It also provides a very good, uh, you know, chance for the for the center to actually integrate northeast uh, into the larger economic development of the country. If you really look at the northeast compared to the other states of the country, uh, it still looks like the northeast is not as developed. And when I'm saying developed, I'm not talking about economic growth. I'm talking about economic development, which means it's an overall development of the region. We still have uh, you know, our children moving out of our state and going out for studies. So, so many things are connected. And of course, there are river diversion plans as Northeast has seems to have a, a lot of water. Now, there are plans, as we know, I'm not going to go into this. And, you know, this this itself is very controversial for me when we say that uh, Brahmaputra has X amount of potential to harness energy. And the reason I say so is we haven't really done an extensive study to even understand what is the potential given the change in the precipitation, given the amount of water that has been used upstream or will be used upstream. So we don't really have those numbers and the figures to say exactly what is the potential that this river basin provides uh, to the country to develop hydropower uh, generation. Now, the challenge, this was part of one of our project, you know, that project basically, uh, we, we brought multiple stakeholders together. And, you know, one of the very interesting thing, and I think, Arnab, you mentioned about it as well, this river basin is highly, highly under-researched. And that's the biggest challenge, I would say. We still really do not know what actually is going to happen if 
if uh, you know China builds dam up there, we are more worried they are constructing the dam. But we are not worried to really study exactly what would be the impact. A, eh? we do not even know what would be the impact downstream Assam if Arunachal uh, you know uh, develops these dams and or captures water, what, what could be the real impact, not the hydrological impact, the socio-economic impact. If you really ask me, we don't really even have the data. To, if, if you ask me, I've been working, I can't tell you what is the exact number of livelihood dependency on this river basin. And there is no uh, uh, you know, open forum where you can actually bring these issues up. And so this, all of this has led to actually two schools of thought. One school who feels that this kind of development is extremely important because water is one such resource which can reduce the uh, poverty that exists in this river basin. On the other hand, there is another group of uh, scholars who feels that this is not sustainable given the kind of topography morphology that we are in. And frankly, can we say we belong to this group or that's where each one of us are not sure because we don't really know what exactly is the situation. And so I always say that there are three eyes which are missing for the Brahmaputra Basin. Information, which leads to uh, you know, mistrust, suspicion, because it's not very clear. Institution, lack of institution, poor capacity of the institution to manage this river basin. And investment, lack of investment too. We do need investment. The investments may come, but they're scared because there are questionable outcome, because we really, again, don't know. If a question comes, what impact X investment would have, we really don't have the answer. We are kind of you know, stuck here. So when you talk about using this river basin for hydropower development, of course, there is potential. But the problem is science is not yet clear. And to top it up, of course, we have one big issue which creates or shapes public opinion is the media reporting. If you look at these media reporting, they are they, they mostly focuses on uh, you know, conflict rather than cooperation. And, and so this is very important and I would not blame the media because again, I have worked very closely with them. The problem is that they have no source of information. They don't know where to go and collect the right information. So they take that what they hear and then they, they, they present it. And large section of our community depends on these media reports and that's how the opinions are formed. And this is what basically uh, needs a lot of transformation. So I feel that as a state of Assam, Assam can actually look at it as one which can give a kind of a, uh, you know, um, action plan to the center because we depend on coal, we have a huge potential, but there is a process to follow, you know, how do you phase out? How do you store the excess energy? What kind of demand side reforms you need? How are you going to ensure that your economy is restructured so that people's livelihood can be uh, you know, and, uh, ensured? So this is one from the point of view of mitigation. If we are looking at impact of climate change and Brahmaputra Basin providing a source of mitigating climate change from hydropower, there is a lot of work that needs to go in. Quickly about adaptation, because I feel one of the reasons people are not happy about these mitigation plans is also because they are not able to adapt to these changes. So if you can make them or ensure that the adaptation is strong enough, then I think there is a possibility that you can actually enhance uh, the, the, the plans that you have. Both adaptation and adaptive capacity important, but these adaptation has to be planned and, and proactive, not ad hoc. What you see today is are mostly ad hoc adaptations, meaning something happened, you gave some resources, they adapted, and then we forgot, we forget about it. Again, next uh, hazard, we give them something else and they adapt. There is no planned adaptation at all. And if you look at the determinants of adaptive capacity, they're nothing different than what we discussed in the sustainable development goals. They basically talks about the development indicators. Any state which have better economic resources, better access to technology, information and skills, good network infrastructure, road connectivity, good institutions, equity, are the one who has better capacity to adapt itself. So if you can, while you know, focusing on generating hydropower, if we are also focusing on these additional component, I think there is a way out to actually move this uh, ahead. And this one slide that I want to bring in is that, uh, you know, mitigation and adaptation moves hand in hand. So what happens is that when you start, you are at the bottom here, where you are talking about coping, vulnerability, disaster risk reduction. And I would say we are right now here. 
When you move to the next level, you're talking about incremental adaptation, one step ahead, where you are coming up with new infrastructure, your expansion of public health services, better variety of crops. And then you move to transformational adaptation, which is like there's a shift in values. And this is not different from mitigation. This is where you will stop emitting GHG completely. So therefore, important that you bring this adaptation and mitigation together because they are not substitutes. This is a little disconnect to what I've been talking, but I want to end with two important slides. One is that I very strongly feel that Assam needs or Northeast needs a very strong center. It could be named anything but a center which is dedicatedly working to understand these different issues that we are facing. But now what we have is very haphazard. Again, I heard and I'm talking about it. There is no one umbrella under which one works. So, you know, we need to have a kind of a climate change center probably. Why climate change center? Because I look at climate change as an umbrella. Everything can come into it. But that is one thing I very strongly feel is required. And for the Brahmaputra River Basin specifically, we need three important strategy. One is there has to be a common knowledge platform. Knowledge cannot be scattered everywhere. It has to be somewhere together so that if one wants to use it for decision making, policy making, it is there for us to uh, you know, share. Disaster and climate resilient is extremely important. We can't just keep on going ahead with the ad hoc way of managing our floods and erosion and cooperation through benefit sharing, which should not only confine to hydropower, it should move beyond hydropower, navigation, fisheries, agriculture, tourism, everything needs to uh, come together. So these are some of the things I think we need to focus on. I will end with this slide where I want to uh, request the audience that if you want to understand this river basin more, we did a podcast, some seven series of podcasts we did with interesting views have come from different and multiple stakeholders. It's available in Spotify and YouTube everywhere. And River of Hope and Sorrow is a photo story exhibition, which brings in a lot of photographs with a story behind uh, each of the photographs. So Anav, I'm going to stop here. Uh, thank you very much. Anamika, thank you so much. It was insightful, comprehensive, and you covered a whole lot of points in a very, very <coughs> precise manner. Thank you very much. And uh, we will continue to engage and i think we have a lot of similar ideas and we would collaborate and take things forward and i think brahmaputra is very close to our heart so we'll definitely take things forward thank you so much for being and please don't forget to write a piece for our uda digest also as i have requested all the panelists and uh, thank you anamika and moving on uh, we have a slight uh, change uh, uh, Gautam Das sir uh, could not join us today because today he has handed over uh, the duties of Director Inland Water Transport. But we have a uh, eminent person not to replace him. He is already part of the panel. Uh, but I think extremely important for this discussion, a uh, very se senior uh, <coughs> official. Uh, we have Jain Singh, sir, who is the vice chairman of the Inland Water Transport Authority. And uh, he belongs to the 1994 batch of the Indian Railways Traffic Service. He served in various capacities in Rajasthan and Gujarat. He has also served as a faculty member at the Lal Bahadur Shastri National Academy of Administration, Masuri, for over five years, where he was an academic in charge of history, politics, and took sessions in public administration and management. He was also the center director of the Center of Disaster Management. Besides public policy, governance, and infrastructure, his areas of interest include national security and geostrategic affairs. He served as a joint secretary at the National Security Council Secretariat under the Prime Minister's office, where he handled matter about internal and external security, besides management of epics of the national security architecture. Jain, sir, thank you so much for joining us. I know you have a very, very busy schedule, but you have been kind to take time off for us and I had an interaction with you at your office and let me tell you that uh, it was very very encouraging to meet a person of your stature and the kind of uh, insight you have was very very encouraging for us and we look forward to working with you your uh, time sir uh, thank you thank you so very much uh, commander das it's a little embarrassing actually and flat starting but thank you very much for uh, giving me this opportunity to uh, to participate and it's a learning for me but 
as uh, luck would have it i mean i'm trying to multitask i have a couple of things on my hand i will not be able to sit through the entire seminar but uh, uh talking about river there's so much uh, that we need to do from the perspective of climate change as well as uh, you know making sure that whatever growth strategies that we adopt are sustainable and when we use the word sustainable as understood in the you know sustainable development goal it's all encompassing so good thing about uh, the assignment what the inland waterways authority of india does is in pursuit of its mission of its own growth it actually promotes uh, sustainable growth because of the intrinsic advantages that water transport has to offer and that and its salience for northeast is what i'll be dwelling upon so a brief introduction since we have a very very diverse uh, and a very eclectic so to speak um, uh, you know uh, the panel panel uh, here so i would just start with just introducing what the uh, what the iwt sector looks like because sitting in delhi i i could never really fathom you know till i joined here that uh, we have such an elaborate architecture in place so uh, we have about 5200 km blah blah the details are there on this slide but what's important is that this is the fastest growing mode of transport in the country so the relevance is underscored by its modal share which is 2% of the overall share but more than that the commitment of the government to both the central government and uh, uh, and these and so many states which have water is running through them are now showing increasing uh, awareness of this mode increasing awareness of water and the moment you start harnessing water for transport you immediately start two or three things which are very relevant from the point of view of uh, ecology also one is maintaining the flow and and then river, river conservancy and guarding against floods and natural disasters so all these things are quite intertwined so it's very very important so it is the fastest growing mode and the benefits it offers to the shippers and this is where i want to dwell upon a little bit is that in terms of its cost it is the cheapest not only in terms of rupees but the, the cost to the ecology is also minimum in terms of the emissions in terms of you know uh, i'll just state a, a, a small example and this is actually uh, more appropriate for odisha and bengal it's certainly appropriate uh, uh, opposite to salient to assam also is that if in case i want to expand my uh, uh, you know the uh, uh, logistics infrastructure be it rail or be it road the first thing that comes to mind the first challenge that comes to mind is land acquisition and the moment i start acquiring lands in area that are densely forested or have very uh, you know fragile eco yeah, fragile ecosystem you know everything then kicks in so we have had these controversies in kerala controversies in uh, goa and i think i i definitely stand by the side of the ecologists there so what river transport does it just mitigates that thing all together the moment you start moving your bulk shipment by water you immediately obviate the need for any land acquisition so that plus the fact that there is low emission plus it is cheap it's it's a very very useful and a eco friendly way of transport so what the inland waterway authority of india does is a small body let me tell you we are all all india we are not more than 400 people including engineers consultants and everyone but our mandate is basically development and regulation of natural waterways in india and on the indo bangladesh protocol route and it's very very relevant in the northeast so in the northeast this is how we stand the entire uh, length of the brahmaputra river starting from sadia right up to dubri 891 kilometers is very very important in national waterway too but now given the important the strategic importance and the ecological importance it is as important for the country as a whole as is the national waterway one on ganga so and brahmaputra of course with the, when we talk about brahmaputra the tributaries also come in the connectivity issue the connectivity to all the northeastern state and most importantly connectivity to bangladesh and connectivity through bangladesh now this is the kind of potential we have in terms this is more of a more a slide for the economics of it but the the, the only point i'm trying to make here is that this, most of the commodities that are moving out of northeast to rest of the country can easily be moved through waterways of course the onus lies on us to make those uh, fairways navigable to have an uh, you know an adequate um, a, a fleet of uh, vessels and to have terminals so we are working towards that is just to sensitize the audience and so much of cargo is divertible per annum to uh, 
to to inland water transport so a, a substantial percentage i mean the maritime vision 2030 has given us a target of about 5% from 2% of the total logistics of india and when it comes to the north east we are definitely targeting more than 20% because in bangladesh 30% of the total cargo movement across the modes is done through inland water transport and this is the potential how it is growing again very very relevant slide of course through another point i would like to make here and i have a i don't have a very long presentation is that see there are two things how other than the fact that the ecological benefit inland water confers upon you know the whole logistics supply uh, logistics uh, value chain that apart by generating i mean by encouraging water transport what we do is we actually in uh, you know enhance and augment the earning of communities that are drawing their sustenance along along the river now any anthropogenic activity by the river side on a fragile ecosystem can damage the environment so we ought to do it in a manner as the previous speaker i think ms barua had rightly brought out we have to the human interventions have to be such even for livelihood that they cause very little small footprint so if you have development of inland water transport i mean i'll be able to generate if i'm able to have two or three good passenger cruise terminals about 20 or roro terminals the kind of uh, spin off they would have on the local employment generation it would obviate their need to start encroaching on forest land and on wetland for cultivation most of the encroachment that have happened over the dec over decades in india have happened in through agriculture only and agriculture as we all understand is a very very non remunerative activity especially in the fragile ecologies of uh, of the northeast so if we actually have some sort of investments in value addition along brahmaputra by means of inland water transport infrastructure then definitely the uh, employment that it generates for have its you know concomitant effect on other anthropogenic activity that may otherwise be harmful for the river so we are working towards that we have two operational terminal one at dhubri one at pandu and one at jogi hopa that's coming up and jogi hopa is actually going to be a very very sta state of the art multimodal terminal perhaps the largest on the, in this part of the world where we'll have a very very seamless integration of the rail road and the waterways and our Uh, uh, initial movements along waterways have already commenced so i'm just i'm just hoping that uh, natural highway infrastructure development corporation is able to achieve its target and we are and i'll give you how it works you see the the stone cargo uh, the stone chips and the you know construction aggregate that is coming from bangladesh had it not been coming to jogi hope it would have traversed all along the length of assam to dhubri and onward to bangladesh by road and imagine the kind of pressure it would put on the highways the amount of emission it would result in so this is the benefit us an unorganized a very poorly constructed barge also is able to carry cargo uh, worth more than 20 to 30 big trailers so this is a kind of environmental benefit that accrue if you have a robust and a vibrant inland water transport system so pandu again this is a beautiful facility just on the outskirts of uh, guwahati so we have a good rail and road interface uh, over there which is happening and of course uh, the, pro the now since our uh, honorable minister also happens to be, uh, was it a former chief minister of assam his vision is actually uh, is quite ambitious and i really do, i don't feel sometimes that i we are really up to it to translate his vision into reality what we are looking at is a series of you know the small row row tourist jetty and all these terminals either side of brahmaputra have these terminals so that we really to the extent possible eliminate for road transport to travel along the length of a river if i am able to have longitudinal movement along brahmaputra it would not only ease the traffic congestion and bring down pollution level it will also you know uh, prevent any further acquisition of land etc so this is the kind of uh, vision we have and the slide that i am showing right now is the development of the eastern uh, waterway transport connectivity grid now this is nothing but the convergence of the national waterway one the ganga bhagirathi hogli system and the indo bangladesh protocol route and merging it effectively with the brahmaputra what it will do is it will give access to the goods and uh, goods emanating from the northeast and going toward northeast from the rest of from the rest of the country right now we are moving purpose everything via the chicken neck corridor via rail or through road both of which have lot lot of issues environmental issues so we'll be able to take care of that 
this again is an ambitious project not so much project not so much from the point of view it's uh, civil engineering and other hydrological challenges but also the you know the paperwork and the governmental thing that will go on i'm just hoping i guess hope i'm the project director of this i'm hoping actually that i'll be able to get all the stakeholders in place and it will be able to sensitize so evac tg i just hope it it registers in the minds of the stakeholders here is what again we are looking at and that said i mean this is what is exists and this is what we have as far as northeast but the other area the where lot of r and d is going on is to have these you know solar powered vehicle we've tested them tried them successfully on national waterway 3 in uh, in kerala the hydrogen fuel cell boats for passenger transport they are running we have had one or two prototype they are working very beautifully they have been uh, the, it's, a, it's a danish i think design and uh, fabricated constructed uh, by the kochi hindustan kochi shipyard limited now we are going to enhance the uh, up that production and we'll have for uh, at least passenger transport more and more such boats coming in and i hope to within a year or to introduce a fleet of such vessels along the brahmaputra also for passenger movement so this is all i had to say i mean from the point of view of ecology i'd be very happy to take any questions thank you thank you so much sir it gives us a lot of confidence and hope uh, because the northeast as you said is extremely critical from a very strategic security perspective yeah. also and yeah. uh, your presentation definitely gives us a lot of i mean i think the government has its plans uh, very clear and i think we all also need to contribute in whatever way possible to complement the government's effort thank you so much sir thank you thank you our next speaker <clears throat> again uh, somebody who has very deep insight into his uh, area of work uh, dr himanshu kulkarni who is the executive director and secretary of acwa dam himanshu kulkarni is the executive director and the secretary at the advanced center for water resources development and management pune he is a hydro geologist by qualification and has been working on aquifers and groundwater across india's diverse groundwater to typology for more than 35 years and he has been actively involved in the advocacy of stronger programs on groundwater management in india himanshu sir your turn please thank you very much for joining us uh thank you arnab uh thank you thank you for inviting me and uh, a, a very good evening to all of you uh my fellow panelists research scholars and friends and uh, you know i'll sort of skip the formalities and come straight to what i uh, i plan to present and i just plan to present to you a set of about 12 slides mostly pictures mostly maps and while i'm doing that i'll try and uh, i'll i'll try and bring in some thoughts some ideas some experiences uh i'll also at the end i would like to allude to about five or six points which i think are extremely important in the context of the brahmaputra basin these are the groundwater resources so this is not a, a very structured presentation so bear with me as as we go along uh river basins and groundwater or rivers river channels and groundwater is something that uh we often think about as two mutually exclusive sets and having said that if we look at yeah so so before before i actually jump into that a quick introduction to aquanam the organization that i i work with full time i also work uh, as adjunct faculty at shivnagar university uh, and teach groundwater but as an organization and, and this is a presentation that i'm actually making on behalf of aquadam uh, we try and work on the concept of bringing aquifers as close as possible to communities or communities as close as possible to aquifers and aquifers are entity which defines the resource of groundwater do a lot of work uh, across india we do a lot of work outside india and our work is on uh, contextualizing groundwater set of uh, 
themes, geographies, and problems on the ground. We do a lot of training. We work through the mode of action research and decision support. And the map actually represents locations where we have worked during the last 20, 22 years. Uh, the colors on the background define the hydrogeological settings or the settings of aquifers different, uh, you know, derived essentially from the geological formations in the subsurface. So that short introduction, let me jump to my main set of slides. Now, many river systems of India are transboundary. So they are, they, they are essentially transboundary river basins. And this is how the Central Water Commission or the Ministry of Water Resources defines river basins or maps out its river basins. Now, having said that, I picked up this very, very interesting map from a book by Ganesh Pandari and others, just to make two very salient points. I mean, we've seen even in, during the course of, uh, of, of today's uh, deliberations, we've seen this, this map presented in different forms. Now, to my mind, the Brahmaputra River Basin, morphological, purely in terms of its, its shape and its size, there's a very unique river morphology for two reasons. One is the source and the mouth are actually very close to each other. I mean, as the crow flies, I measured it about 300 maybe a little more than 300, 400, 500 kilometers as it grow flies. And this in itself is a very, very interesting morphology because I don't think there's any other river system in the world that shows you that kind of a morphology, where the mainstream of the river actually bends, does a U-turn, and then it again does a right angle turn as it comes into, uh, into the delta. It's also transboundary for another set of uh, reasons. And I think uh, Anamika alluded to that. Uh, if you look at climate, look at the range of climatic zones, transcending from cold, dry, high altitude regions to very warm, humid regions, it transcends an entire spectrum of climatic zones. I'm still not talking of change. I won't, I won't talk of change. I'll just talk of variability. I think it's one of the most variable landscapes that a river basin has across the world. Now, what I've done is um, I've actually taken the help of our young brigade at Aquadam. We are looking at uh, sort of river basins from an aquifer setting point. Forget the colors. What I've done is I've taken the Ganga, I've taken the Brahmaputra, and I've taken the uh, sort of Godavari, Krishna, and Kaveri, the peninsular river basins. And you see that they're so different, purely in terms of the underlay of geological formations that constitute different aquifer settings. Now, the other reason I'm also showing these, these two maps alongside. The Ganga and the Brahmaputra, and these, this is only the Indian part of the Ganga and Brahmaputra. And I am using the metaphor that these are joined at the hip. They have very close source regions, and they come together, they confluence together when they join uh, the Bay of Bengal. So, when we look at these systems, and I am now bringing about a comparison that if you look at the size of the Ganga basin and the size of the Brahmaputra basin. The Brahmaputra is also unique because it doesn't have the size of the Ganga, but it simply has the same degree of variability, agroclimate, geology, and of course, the underlying aquifer systems. So, I believe, and these, again, these two basins are very different from the peninsular basins because the peninsular basins are dominantly underlain by hard rock geology. Look at the Kavit. Kaveri is a small basin, slightly smaller than the Brahmaputra, but it's essentially one dominant color. So, we delve deeper into these 
into the Brahmaputra basin. Uh, again, let's take drainage, for example. Simply the network of uh, small and large rivers that sort of bring give rise to the Brahmaputra River. The diversity in the drainage of geometry. So even if we look at the biophysical context from a drainage point of view, it represents an extremely diverse hydrogeomorphology. And when we look at an extremely diverse hydrogeomorphology such as this one, obviously we are going to get an extreme diversity in the underlying aquifer systems. Going forward, if you look at the degree of groundwater development in the Brahmaputra River Basin, and this is derived from Central Groundwater Board's uh, latest assessment done in 2006-17 and published in 2019. And think about this from the point of view of being relatively un under, I wouldn't call it underdeveloped, relatively lesser developed, explored, and exploited. This is what the map is showing us. So, however, when we get into the sort of micro level uh, sort of assessment and, and, and experiences, we find that although this basin is somewhat, uh, you know, from purely from a macro assessment point of view, not too much of groundwater exploitation, nowhere near to what Punjab and Haryana and some of those regions are parts of the Ganga River Basin, but there are foci of exploitation of groundwater that are emerging in the basin especially in growing urban centers. And I think the macro often hides the micro. And I think it's sort of going back to what my friend Arnab was alluding to earlier, that we need a bottom-up. And I think we need a bottom-up approach, not just to address problems, because I think the macro, micro is often hidden under the macro. I was listening very carefully to uh, what uh, Mishraji was talking about in terms of contamination. And even if we look at a very, very broad set of uh, derivatives from, from data, micro will, of course, be very different. Find that there are some serious issues of groundwater contamination, particularly because Brahmaputra at the size of the size of the basin that we are looking at in India is perhaps the only basin in which the most serious uh, geogenic contamination issues, arsenic and fluoride, coexist. Normally, these tend to be mutually exclusive from each other. None of the peninsular basins actually show such a high uh, preponderance of arsenic. But in the northern basins, Ganga, uh, the Indus and the Brahmaputra, you actually find, especially considering the size of the Brahmaputra, I think this is a serious matter. I'm still not alluding to other contaminants, uh, whether they are sort of industrial contaminants, agriculture related contaminants, or even some of the urban uh, related contamination, uh, contamination issues. Coming to the aquifer setting, I think some of the most Diverse and complex aquifer systems for a river basin of its size exist in the Brahmaputra basin. Now, I won't go into the details of what these colors represent. Now, one of the first uh, thing that strikes me when I look at the Brahmaputra river basin is the stippling part, the red dots, which represent what one of my colleagues many years ago, ago coined as springscapes. We actually do a lot of work on the revival of springs. We work in Sikkim, we work through partnerships, as I've said before. We are doing currently doing uh, work with the government of Meghalaya on the revival of springs there. We work with the government of Nagaland. We've just begun some work with uh, in, in Manipur, of course, in one of the northeastern states. But essentially, Meghalaya, Nagaland, Sikkim, West Bengal, and a little bit of work in Arunachal. The reason I'm actually bringing this up is this is one of the most neglected, but one of the most glaring aspects on how 
some of the headwater headwaters in the Brahmaputra region is generated. It is generated through springs, and it's again. I'll come to I'll come to this a little bit in detail when I summarize in the last slide. So when we look at a system of such diverse uh, aquifer systems, a river basin with such diverse aquifer systems, let me also throw you a set of numbers. If someone were to ask me, what is the potential groundwater storage in the uh, Brahmaputra basin, this part of the Brahmaputra basin, basically the Indian part of the Brahmaputra. And using a simple uh, model based on our experiences on the ground, I was able to come up with a very, very gross figure of about 160 billion cubic meters only in the shallow upper um, 10 meters. 10 to 15 meters, what we call as the shallow unconfined aquifers uh, that, that, that the basin holds. What is interesting further is out of this, nearly 150 billion cubic meters is essentially in the yellow part because that's the flat the sand silt clay uh, part of the basin. But what is also interesting about is about the four to five to maybe a little more than that billion cubic meters of what the mountain aquifer systems are actually holding and very often through a sustained release mechanism feeding to the surface water systems in uh, the, the, the headwaters of the Brahmaputra basin. These are just numbers and I mean I'm just throwing these numbers because the occurrence and availability of groundwater actually happens at a very very skewed scale when you look at basinal scale estimates. The Central Groundwater Board has put out some interesting sample aquifer maps. Uh, I'm just showing you these two graphics, which also shows you how diverse and variable, even the alluvial systems, the, the sort of flat the yellow part that I showed you in the map before, can be. A certain degree of heterogeneity or a certain degree of inhomogeneity in even the sort of yellow part of the river basin. Now, I'd like to end with three slides. And I want to come back to the slide on springs. One of the reasons I'm sort of showing you this slide is that we've done an estimate for the Indian Himalayan region for three large river systems the Sindhu, the Ganga, and the Brahmaputra. And our estimate based on Again, a very, very conservative estimate based on the locations, the different locations where we have worked, and we've come out with a density uh, count for these locations, is that there are at least two to three million springs in these three river basins. So if you expand this to the 10 large river systems, the 10 large transboundary systems in the Hindu Kush Himalayan region across different countries over nearly three and a half million square kilometers, you are able to come up with a number of eight to 10 million per million springs. And what is springs? Springs is nothing but groundwater. So therefore, I think it might be useful to also begin to estimate the number of springs in the Brahmaputra river basin, which will give us an additional dimension or an additional peak, a very, very crucial peak into the groundwater in the headwater regions of this, uh, this, this basin. Also, we have to remember that transboundaryness is not just about where the river enters, comes from one country and enters into the other. Transboundaryness also happens at the catchment of the river, and especially these catchments, especially these aquifers in the headwater regions also have a certain degree of transboundaryness, which I believe is not necessarily explored because it's again hidden behind the larger veneer or the big river channels and so on. Now, there's another reason why I brought up the question of springs. That is because two, two things. Springs represent the oldest source of groundwater in any river system. Far, far before we built dams, far, far before we actually constructed wells. 
being a natural source, something that you know nature converts atmospheric water, rainfall, rainfall percolates into the ground, it enters aquifers, and at certain points it actually exits and becomes surface water again. I also believe it is the greenest source of water. We were talking of green energy, we were talking of energy. And I think there is a necessity given that the Brahmaputra basin has a very large springscape, as I would call it, more than 50% of its headwaters, or in fact, all the headwaters, more than 50% of its area in India is under what I call the spring springs. And therefore, to conclude, I believe, and I, with this little background, I want to suggest five basic points for developing a ground, a system of groundwater governance in the Brahmaputra basin. First is I think it's important for us to remember that sustainable management of groundwater would be achieved if we avoid the classical exploration groundwater in pursuit of Indian so the classical approach of exploring for more and more groundwater to pursue individual sourcing of groundwater. I mean, I can expand on that this for another hour, but I'll just leave it. Um, I think we need to bring in a very strong element. We need to bring in a very strong consideration to groundwater quality in water security plan. Uh, and I think uh, we, we must look at this part fully from a water security point of view because we find that in a lot of the villages or even in townships like Guwahati, there is a significant amount of groundwater usage, whether it is as a standalone source or as a supplementary source to other mainstream uh, water supply provisions. I think it's important for us to remember that. Spring shed management, the protection, revival, restoration, and governance of springs and spring water systems. I think it requires a differential approach to the northern mountains and southern hills because the Brahmaputra is bounded by these two systems. And this is more for, uh, for Arnav. Arnav, you talked about, interestingly, you talked about uh, underwater domain awareness. And I want to bring in the underground subsurface domain awareness to sort of uh, to confluence with that idea. I think we have a good, we might be able to have a good handle on what what are the base flows from aquifers to the river the river system, which is essentially subterranean uh, groundwater. We see groundwater emerging from the land and flowing into the river system. But what about subaquatic, subchannel groundwater discharge? And this might be an area to explore further in terms of what are the aquifer systems feeding as groundwater discharge into the main course of the Brahmaputra or even into some of the tributaries of the Brahmaputra. Bringing aquifers, river systems and ecosystem approaches to a sort of a confluence could be one way of or could be perhaps the common approach to, look, to looking at groundwater management and groundwater governance in a basin like the Brahmaputra. I'll stop there. Thank you again for your patience, and uh, I'll I'll wait to see if there are any questions. Thank you so much. I think uh, again you bring a very different dimension, and the depth of work is very very evident. And it was fascinating to understand this dimension of it. And as you ri rightly said, we would definitely try and come together and work towards the better Brahmaputra or better uh, Northeast region in whatever way possible. Thank you so much. Thank you. We have a young but extremely energetic speaker coming next. If I may use the word, he's my younger brother, Dr. Pranab Pater. Dr. Pa Pater took over as the CEO of Global Foundation in January 2019. And since then, he has been steering the organization to prominence by working on water resources, conservations, and restoration of water bodies, mountain sustainable development, climate action, and building climate resilience through promotion of low carbon energy solutions, 
sustainable livelihood and environmental capacity enhancement. Due to his contribution and noble work, he recently received the Green Future Leadership Award and the Water Leadership Award. Pranab, your turn. And I really appreciate the energy that you bring. And it's always fun to be with you and discuss things. Thank you so much. Thank you. Pleasure is all mine, uh, Dada. Uh, absolutely amazing session so far. Very well thought out discussions, thought provoking presentations by previous speakers, uh, including Dr. Kulkarni, whom I've, I've known for a long time, and uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Anamika Bolwa, who's my colleague in Terry many years ago. Uh, lovely, and, and of course, uh, Dr. Arup Mishra, uh, Dada, also as well. <clears throat> So I'm going to use a small presentation, of course, uh, in the interest of time, I'm, I would uh, be willing to cut short a few slides, maybe, because I have uh, prepared about 20 odd slides. Uh, so I, let me just quickly go to the share. Uh, so absolutely honored to be here uh, speaking on this forum today. Thank you once again uh, to Dr. Dazda. Uh, I'm going to speak uh, on a rather di uh, different topic altogether. You know, our previous speakers have been largely talking about the morphology, topography, climate change uh, issues, the challenges the river basin as such is facing uh, all along over the years. So I'm going to uh, uh, slightly divert from the domain and uh, talk about uh, uh, solutions as such that might come through community engagement and CSR opportunities that is available. Uh, CSR, as I say, corporate social uh, responsibility opportunities that is available in the Northeast, particularly along the river Brahmaputra. Uh, so quickly, before I do that, uh, I, I would like to quickly give you a little uh, background about the organization that I represent. Yes, uh, it's a, uh, a relatively small and new uh, initiative. It's called Global Foundation for Advancement of Environment. It's uh, basically an Indo-American uh, initiative. Uh, so we essentially it was set up uh, uh, on the triple bottom line philosophy, which is uh, people, profit, and planet. Uh, that that idea and the concept of, you know, bringing synergy to these three important elements of our existence. Uh, as far as our work is concerned, we work on water, climate action, and food security, food and nutrition security issues uh, across uh, various states in India. So now uh, coming to our main focus, I'm going to give you a little uh, background, of course, uh, as, uh, particularly Professor Borua made my work easy because you know, she has already touched upon a few, few issues like SDGs that I wanted to touch. Uh, so, so let's look at some of the common issues that we are uh, facing uh, in general across, uh, uh, across India and, 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 and in this uh, river basin in particular. Uh, if we look at this slide uh, carefully, this uh, it's a collage of few pictures. You know, you see a lot of pictures that are something unusual and something unwanted. Like for example, floods, cyclones happening, the droughts happening, pollutions or, 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 or emergence of or, or waterborne diseases, forest fire, crop failing, so on and so forth. So all the seas are these are common issues faced by humanity at this point, and particularly in India, these all of these are very common, very uh, uh, regularly faced by people across the Indian geography and in, across Indian state. So all these pictures put together are a thinking or a, or a perhaps a sense of. Uh, helplessness that you know we are gradually becoming uninhabitable and if we look at this particular slide you know there are quite a few large chunk of landmass across the globe are becoming un uninhabitable and if at this current state it, by these statistics you know if we look at this black dots there are few patches across africa and mediterranean also in india these are considered as seriously uninhabitable. But by 2070, things are going to be even more difficult. We'll have more areas which will become inevitable very soon because of these common environmental challenges that we are facing or we are seeing, experiencing as on today. 
So these changes, of course, uh, the, the kind of change, particularly in climate change, this is one change we don't want to see, we don't want to experience. You know, although human beings uh, by nature, you know, uh, we, we aspire for change, but this is one change nobody wants. So, so things are becoming very difficult locally, regionally, nationally, and globally. So now coming to the Brahmaputra Valley and its growing vulnerabilities, which are very well explained by our previous speakers. You know, uh, the changes that we experience in, in this particular valley, which is not just the river system, uh, 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 river alone, but it is a, it's a river system. It's a, it's a confluence of multiple ecosystems. And if we look at uh, the, the figures available today, nationally, internationally, including the recent studies undertaken by Professor Barua and her team, at IIT Guwahati, you know, vulnerabilities are becoming commonly evident. We, whether we like it or we don't like it, whether we are experiencing right away, right now, but this is this is there. It's just there, uh, about to knock our doors. In fact, it has already started uh, to see certain, you know, uh, unwanted scenarios uh, by means of uh, floods and other. Uh, climate vulnerabilities. If we look at these rainfall and temperature pattern of Brahmaputra Valley, so this this set of pictures that I have put together here in this slide, it clearly shows how things are changing from uh, 1951 uh, uh, till 2007. So rainfall is absolutely it's going haywire. Temperature is changing. It's becoming warmer day by day. So who's who's going to be the biggest sufferer for this? Obviously, apart from humanities, apart from the people. So uh, the biggest sufferer of the change that we are experiencing in this valley is going to be our the, the rich richness of our biodiversity. The biodiversity of this region, which is considered as one of the seven richest hotspots, biodiversity hotspots in the world. And so obviously, since uh, a large chunk of the river flows through uh, the uh, the state of Assam. So Assam is obviously going to be the immediate sufferer uh, if things go the way uh, uh, they are today. Uh, uh, now coming to the biodiversity, which is uh, I'm the reason I'm trying to focus on these these things because you know uh, as we as we experience uh, inevitable changes in in our environment, the problems are emerging day by day and new. Uh, situations are being created because of an, uh, climate change and other uh, environmental vulnerabilities. So obviously this uh, rich uh, area, uh, region, which is also a confluence of multiple biomes, at least four biomes, uh, it's a conjuncture of at least four biomes. And obviously that resulted in a very, very rich uh, diversity of mammals, birds, uh, insects, flora, and, and all, the, all other species. And many of them are, of course, endangered and endemic, and endemic that is found nowhere else but only in this region. So, with this emerging issues and challenges of our environment, so the sustainable development goals, which was also rightly mentioned by Professor Anamika Burwa, are becoming very, very relevant. In fact, is all these 17 sustainable development goals that we are referring to all day in and day out these days are a result of the challenges faced by humanity and, the, uh, and, and our concentrated effort to deal with them individually and collectively. So if we look at our current situation, one problem is leading to another. So thereby, if we want to target and if we want to talk about solutions if we start looking at one domain for example climate change we will probably be able to also address and bring solution to other uh, issues as well like for example uh, 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 this slide that talks about you know how uh, climate change is linked to global warming pollution and water stress and thereby creating challenges in the water domain but at the same time the uh, the uh, amount of solutions put together, amount of efforts, mitigation and adaptation me measures put together that can provide ease to other areas uh, of, of 
of the sustainable development goals like for example good life good health uh, uh, life on land life underwater so on and so forth and similarly it can also bring a uh, 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 kind of a support to other areas such as agriculture uh, creation creation of uh, employ uh, employment and livelihood so on and so forth so uh, the why i am trying to emphasize on sdgs is sdgs are interlinked it's a set of complex goals that are put together internationally by uh, the members of the united nation and they are working together and so if we want to uh, work on and and bring about solutions to our larger problems like uh, the problems that are being faced in the the brahmaputra valley we'll have to also sink in and align our focus at the local level with these broad goals uh this is something uh, professor barua has already mentioned you know the the current performance of uh, in the northeastern region as far as sdgs are concerned is not very promising so obviously that that offers an an opportunity and also a necessity for us to do more so thereby i see a lot of opportunities are getting unveiled over a period of time so i would like to cite this very popular and i keep citing this all the time by ram emmanuel who is a mayor of chicago and uh, and once uh, the head, head of chief of staff at white house he'll say he never let a serious crisis go to waste uh, because it's an opportunity to do things that we otherwise could not do before so uh, so when we are looking at uh, uh, all these environmental and em emerging environmental problems it they are actually providing us opportunities opportunities in in terms of adaptation in terms of mitigation in terms in terms of alternatives and that's why the csr which is an untapped opportunity for the northeast the, the reason i'm saying untapped because i'm going to explain in my next slide they are they can and they are offering a huge chunk of untapped resources financial resources which can be put together leveraged by uh, local communities by local ngos civil societies and also government agencies to get things right as far as uh, the brahmaputra is concerned so the way out is to engage communities at the local level and, and and identify the problems identify areas and gap areas where communities can be engaged to offer opportunities and they offer opportunities for them as well as for the environment it should uh, it should be a win win for both the communities and the for, for the environment sustainability so if we look at the current uh, csr spendings uh, across india the highest amount of spendings are taking place as of uh, uh, financial year 18 2018 education health and rural areas obviously get the uh, maximum uh, whereas uh, an environment comes at a later stage which is at, on number 5 and unfortunately uh, despite the need and the necessity uh, the environment is not getting the kind of attention it should receive as far as csr is concerned as far uh, according to the latest report only about 5% of the total spending is being utilized in the water sector the revival restoration and distribution of fresh water uh, drinking water so which is very very minuscule and so obviously we have more scope and 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 an opportunity to bring more attention more investment through csr in the environment sector environment and rural rural development sector so now coming to the north is although in the recent years maybe in last 7 uh, 8 uh, years we see a very uh, a promising increase in the csr spending in the north is in fact some of the states have recorded 200 to 300% rise as far as csr spending is concerned but we should not forget that you know amount is very minuscule you know if we look at uh, this pie chart here the fund distribution state wise is very very small in in places like mizoram which is still considered almost 0% which is so th that gives us more opportunity and aspiration to do more as far as csr so 
and 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 it is not very difficult you know although somehow for some reason we have been not been able to tap this opportunity untapped opportunity of csr but there's opportunity of to do more to and align activities with what the companies are looking at what the country is looking at what the region is looking at and obviously what the as this is a goals are uh, are directing it so as i said csr is an untapped potential uh, in in this uh, in 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 the northeast area, uh, region and also in as far as uh, as far as uda is concerned it is absolutely a new domain uda uda itself is a new domain especially for the northeast so obviously we can uh, emphasize more on uh, channelizing uh, csr resources towards focusing on education and skill development which is going to be a biggest biggest area of uh, our focus in the coming days and years so obviously the reason i am saying because since this is a new domain so there there's uh, this it's, it's we barely know anything about uds so there's lot to be done lot to be understood lot to be researched and lot to be studied uh, in fact uh, dr kulkarni also emphasized and uh, so uh, so so was professor borwa and dr das emphasized that the need of for research in the brahmaputra uh, uh, basin in this uh, 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 under uda framework so obviously along the research education and skill development is going to play a very important part in creating opportunities in understanding more about our region and also obviously creating livelihood and employment and when i say education and skill development so it can perhaps uh, emphasize on three very important areas health water and sanitation that's one very important area agriculture and rural development is another the third most important and critical area is the environment sustainable development and renewable energy so when we are seeing the emergence and of course thanks to the recent uh, initiatives taken by the current uh, the, the the government dispensation both at the state level and the central uh, uh, the, uh, the union level so uh, through acties policy they are emphasizing more on creating resources opportunities but to be able to capture these resources we will need people who are empowered who are capable who are skilled who are educated so we see a lot of opportunities for local capacity development skill development and also most importantly entrepreneurship development so that's another important area we should not forget in india at at, at, at uh, is in a cusp of you know uh, entrepreneurship uh, revolution and uh, northeast india should not lag behind in you know uh, capturing this momentum uh, so uh, so once we are able to create ample amount of skill development you know very specific very target oriented uh, skill development of uh, programs and and curriculums modules for target audience youths and interested uh, uh, stakeholders so we will be able to uh, capture opportunities along these important uh, domains of and create resilience building uh, exercises along uh, creating livelihood and employment so uh, with this note i am almost there at the end of my presentation as i said i wanted to be quick uh, and i see there's a need and uh, both at the implementation level as well as the policy level to look at the a decentralized approach of development and conservation to be able to leverage uh, the opportunities through csr within csr and the beyond so uh, to be able to mobilize and engage of course we need capable communities to promote localized income generating conservation action because you know conservation uh, conservation used to be uh, an stand alone activity earlier but now given the current need we no longer afford to look at conservation as an stand alone activity 
know, without community engagement. Conservation has to be community oriented and should be able to generate uh, economic returns. And another very important area as far as uh, Dr. Vesin is concerned, like I said, it, it is a river system. It is a combination of numerous ecosystem, particularly aquatic ecosystems, smaller and large uh, uh, wetlands and ponds, beals, so on and so forth. So given the com compact complexity of this river system, we will also have to look at restoring, conserving, and pr protecting water bodies across this uh, basin, across this landscape, not just look, uh, look at the river alone. And that is possible by engaging with CSR uh, and companies and corporates, thanks to the 2% mandatory uh, spendings uh, for companies above uh, 1,000 turnover, uh, 1,000 crore turnover. So this uh, resource is readily available, just that we need to approach, we need to uh, 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 create, you know, right kind of channels for them to invest in CSR projects uh, in the Northeast. And uh, the reason I want to focus on uh, the smaller, the water bodies of all shapes and size, including smaller ones, because you know they are interconnected water bodies and ecosystems, and they are equally important. When we say in uh, the northeast is a uh, biological hotspot, biodiversity hotspot, these smaller ecosystems contribute to it becoming a hotspot. It becoming a larger, uh, 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 you know, refuse and habitat for you know, all these endangered and rare species of flora and fauna. So obviously, every single ecosystem, large or small, has a role to play and, and, and has an important role to play, rather. So we have to also shift our focus, uh, protected area focus uh, conservation to decentralized conservation of areas which are outside protected areas. In fact, recently, UNDP and IUCN has also promoted a new concept called OECM. It's, it is basically to emphasize an identification of areas which are of uh, ecological potential outside the protected area system. So this kind of approaches are also required and that can very well gel well with priorities of our co co companies and corporations to for them to be able to uh, support CSR funded conservation projects, community based projects, livelihood projects that will in turn benefit the larger interest of uh, the, the Brahmaputra Valley. And, uh, and the last not, uh, but not uh, the least, uh, the importance of deploying sustainable technologies for fixing water pollution, which was highlighted by uh, Dr. Mishra sir. Uh, this, the smaller bodies are easy to, uh, water bodies are easy to rather uh, uh, manage and also as far as uh, the pollution is concerned it's relatively easy to address as a, for example uh, the subsurface horizontal flow uh, constructed wetland which is a very popular technology these days in being promoted and uh, deployed across various water bodies uh, in India especially in the urban areas which is uh, as considered as a uh, considered uh, as an a cheaper alternative of uh, water treatment plant, uh, uh, sorry, uh, sewage treatment plant. So that kind of technologies uh, can be promoted and deployed across uh, point solution uh, uh, pollution sources, wherever they are. It could be a uh, could be a river, or it could be a small stream, it could be uh, an uh, a pond or a wetland, so on and so forth. And the last important point that I want to highlight and which is which should be equally of importance, national importance, national and local importance, which is marrying the traditional ecological knowledge with latest science and technology innovation, which is going to be very, very important and critical for to be able to create uh, a future which is sustainable, which is water secure, energy secure and food secure. So that's all why I wanted to share. Thank you. Thank you once again. Uh, Anupta for kindly giving me this opportunity. Thank you, Pranab. Thank you so much. Uh, it's always very refreshing to get your viewpoint, and these are extremely important. And I think 
we are able to cover a whole lot of aspects uh, to comprehensively move forward in this direction. Uh, our next speaker uh, is uh, Sri Jagdish Kadam, CEO of Rajput Infocon. Uh, as a founder chairman of Rajput Infocom, he has contributed to the agricultural prosperity of Maharashtra by providing various irrigation and transport facilities. He has successfully executed various projects of government, semi-government, corporate sector and as well as cooperative sector. Mr. Kadam, with his managerial and planning skills, has consistently succeeded in implementation and completion of some of the most critical projects. And one of the most important uh, thing is they have created a world record in terms of building 40 kilometers of road in 24 hours. So, and sir has been recently been uh, awarded for that. And many of these have been awarded. <coughs> so, uh, and now Infocon has been kind enough to support MRC in taking forward the Indian Water Transport uh, Center of Excellence. Uh, Jagdish sir, thank you so much. Thank you, my friend, Dr. Arnavji. Uh, namaste, everyone present in this webinar. Uh, whichever time I could uh, listen to the speakers, some of the speakers. So, uh, though I am not an expert in this field. There are so many academicians, the researchers, the doctors, the noble speakers into this webinar. It was a great feeling to hear because I am a civil engineer. So I could understand, uh, understood the, the importance of this field. I think uh, it was uh, actually, as far as India is concerned, it was uh, neglected that way. But uh, thanks to this government, central government, uh, because our prime minister, uh, he focused uh, on this field and he has decided to expand uh, this field in the near future. We, as a Rajput in we are into this field in, of infrastructure development uh, from more than last three decades. I did my civil engineering from a college called COAP in Pune, 1986. And then I started this business. And the infrastructure development is our passion. And with the help of patience and perseverance, we could achieve a lot. Uh, as my friend Dr. Arnab uh, just uh, mentioned, that we did a world record of uh, executing 40 kilometer road in 24 hours time in Maharashtra, Satara district. We are into uh, infrastructure business like uh, uh, state highways, the national highways, the irrigation dams, the canals, the pipelines. Now we are, we are entering into the airports, the railways, and now we are looking for the inland waterways. And that's why when I met Dr. Arnabji, and we talk and I like his uh, attitude and uh, his, uh, uh, we can say, the liking for in this field. So we have decided to come together and that's why Rajput Infracon is with Dr. Arnabji. The Rajput Infracon has partnered MRC to build national capacity and capability of uh, for taking forward the inland water transport, that means IWT, project at the national and regional level. The core focus will be tropical littoral waters to create a unique understanding of the local site specific characteristics to be able to contribute to the mega project announced by Government of India. I understand import of technology has not worked and there is requirement to work on indigenous R&D. The IWT is a mega project envisaged to build 20,000 kilometers of national waterways across 116 rivers. As I understand from the eminent speakers today, the Brahmaputra is a very unique river with its own challenges. Thus, a lot more efforts are required to create domain awareness to be able to drive the IWT project effectively. 
we at rajpath are committed to support mrc and ndt in this mission of uda the nw1 and nw2 have started execution to some extent and it is felt that massive capacity and capability gap exists such mega projects also have huge potential to generate opportunities for young india however the skilling and knowledge gap is a serious concern thus we can contribute significantly to this sector of national importance a center of excellence coe is a unique model to build capacity and capability across multiple verticals to comprehensively mitigate the gaps the policy and technology interventions along with acquisition capacity and capability building can be driven from such a coe in a seamless manner the details of the coe have been discussed by my friend dr arnab ji in this presentation the objective of setting up the coe can be categorized into five areas the first build futuristic academic programs aligned to the strategic national vision this is aligned to the ministry education initiatives of industry relevant academic programs second build site specific local r&d programs to solve real world problems backed by field experimental validations this is aligned to the ministry of science and technology initiatives for encouraging indigenous r&d research and development third to become the unique capacity and capability building center for the iwt project the massive capacity and capability building initiative of the ministry of shipping ports and waterways will be better served by this program fourth the mrc attracts students from iits and other premier institutes to come and work as interns and fellows young professionals from stakeholders also join the program for higher learning such cross pollination across multiple levels will bring in an ecosystem for peer learning and enhance academic and research culture and the final one the broadening of horizon for the students will generate a new ecosystem for enhanced learning and deeper understanding of industry relevant innovations massive cater opportunities will be opened up and the students will be adequately equipped to grab these opportunities uda fellowships will be on offer to the students and young professional across disciplines i think there is a, a vast scope in near future the sky is the limit which i think so uh, as far as this uh, waterways are concerned so we all will come together and will make india proud will work for the samarth bharat sashakt bharat thank you everyone thank you dr anup ji thank you so much sir <coughs> such support actually build uh, comprehensive uh, programs and we thank you for your support and there's a long way to go uh, going forward and we will work together and take this forward thank you so much sir my pleasure uh, thank you now i have uh, professor ajay dandekar somebody who's with whom i've been working very closely now uh, in terms of understanding what is required uh, Dr. Dandekar is the director of the School of Humanities and Social Sciences and the Center for Public Affairs and Critical the Theory at the Shivnatha University. Dr. Dandekar is a recipient of many honors and awards, including the International Visitor Leadership Program and Professor K T M Hegde Fellowship. He has also has the distinction of serving on many government of India committees, including the Planning Commission. Dr. Dandekar has a PhD from the Center of for Historical Study, Jawaharlal Nehru University. He has worked on issues of <coughs> denotified and nomadic communities and pastoral nomadic groups, and his recent work focuses on areas that include issues of resources and conflict in the tribal heartland. 
Ajay sir, your turn, please. I'm sorry, we got a little delayed. Thank you. A small correction. Uh, I was the director of the school, but in March, uh, I gave it up uh, to better concentrate on research. Uh, thank you, Arnav. And it is a it is a privilege to speak in this distinguished panel to to a very distinguished audience uh, and a very very eminent uh, audience. Uh, I won't take much of your time. I know it is very late already. Uh, I want to just uh, put out some issues uh, which also perhaps could be germane to what we have been discussing. Uh, so far, uh, the issues that have come out on such a very complex river system uh, as uh, Brahmaputra pertain to climate uh, to climate change, to morphology, to, to geology, uh, to the livelihoods uh, on one hand. Uh, and on the other hand, the risk factors such as the climate, which has been put in the risk factor, which is it's quite an interesting formulation, actually. Um, and the potentialities, uh, of course, uh, of within quotation marks, exploiting the potential of the river, uh, where the inland water transport, uh, with its massive challenges, actually, given the way uh, floods and silting. So actually, the question would be there, for how many months of the year the river is available for inland water transport? Not just for this question, perhaps is pertain uh, pertaining not just for Brahmaputra, but for all the rivers in the country. Uh, given, of course, uh, the silting as well as given uh, the monsoons and given the floods. But that's a separate issue. I think that is not uh, uh, on the table right now. Uh, along with all this, I I thought that I'd just put out a few things. On which I have a little bit of, uh, I won't say knowledge, interest is the right word. Uh, I'm not a domain expert on on Brahmaputra, but I'm an interested party there uh, because of my uh, research uh, interest uh, that spins over the other side of the border uh, from Assam and Arunachal Pradesh. And here is where I would like to raise a few. Uh, points uh, just for my curiosity i suppose more than anything else so one is it is always good uh, in strategic thinking to think of the unthinkable uh, because if we don't think of the unthinkable the strategic thinking does not go forward and uh, if that lapse happens then nations do play or rather regions uh, in our case uh, uh, middle and rural riparian uh, may Pay very heavily, actually. Uh, a very parallel example, not pertaining to uh, the water systems, but to not to think the unthinkable, uh, and there could be many, but the one that very glaringly comes to my mind is the massive error the Americans made at Palawar uh, by not even thinking in terms of whether the Japanese had the capacity to mount a uh, to, to mount a, uh, you know, that that uh, massive thrust through the aircraft carriers across some 2,500 uh, miles of the sea. They did not think in those terms. Uh, some of them did. They, in fact, was a war exercise done uh, at the Pearl Harbor by the Americans, uh, which actually predicted the way that could have been done. But the American High Command ignored uh, the results of the war exercise. It's good to think of the unthinkable. There could be many other, uh, I think, uh, avenues where you know similar uh, ideas can uh, can be thought through. Here, in the case of uh, Brahmaputra, uh, the unthinkable though has uh, a framework, uh, and that framework comes from, to my mind, three issues. One is that both uh, India as well as uh, China are water starred. If, if you look 100 years ahead, then uh, there are various estimates and whichever estimate we take, the conclusion would be that we will be short of uh, drinking water uh, by a very large measure, and so also would be China. China's added grief, of course, is that uh, their uh, geographical structure is such that one part of China has always remained water start, and therefore uh, the water diversion projects and the three routes that they 
talk about some of them are activated some of them are not uh, some of them perhaps are undergoing technical feasibility studies some of them could be just pipe dreams but whatever the the, the ground uh, reality is that there is a real crisis of water that looms uh, over the over asia uh, and involving these two very major uh, countries second aspect to this is that there is an effort by china to emerge as a water hegemon in the region uh, this is very evident from the fact that the way they are dealt with uh, the partners or rather their neighbors along the mekong uh, and uh, there is some lesson to be learned uh, from there and the third of course is uh, the climate uh, there is a commitment i think uh, from their side to reduce uh, the thermal uh, exposure by 15% uh, it, by china uh, it could vary here and there but to my mind i think i'm right if i'm right 15% is what they committed now if we take these three things together how is it that they are going to address the water crisis number 1 how is it that they are going to reduce the thermal exposure by 15% to meet the climate change goals and three how are they going to balance their aspirations of being not not just an asian hegemon but a global player and of course to emerge as an asian hegemon and how does one respond to all the three what are the implications of that kind of a thinking done by our northeastern neighbor uh tibet is central of course there the indo tibetan border as we know and i would rather today's context call it an indo tibetan border uh you know uh has always been uh an issue between uh the chinese aspirations and uh, our efforts to protect the autonomy of tibet um i think the 62 resulted from there and all the other things i emanated from from there now if 15% 15% uh, shift has to be made by china from thermal to hydel then what are the options before them all kinds of wild guesses uh, have been made on this uh from including from their sources as well uh the the wildest one of course is that uh, 60 whatever gigawatt uh, of a structure on the band to a more conservative 38 uh, gigawatt uh, but even 38 gigawatt is almost double the size of uh, the three gorges uh now there could be many many uh arguments against the chinese embarking on such a venture uh, and very credible arguments uh, i'm sure uh, they would be given the nature of the geology uh, in in the upper yalong sangpo at the bend uh, given uh, the massive investments that is going to uh, cost them as well as uh, the finite feasibility of all this actually uh, questions have been posed you know on on, the, on that uh, in the literature that is available but for us and when we say us uh, one should include uh, not just uh, not just the nation state boundaries but the river basin approach if we take then the the middle and the low riparian concerns uh, if one has to take those in that we must factor uh, the unthinkable if we factor the unthinkable then only we can think in terms of water security uh, water securities or securities of that, those kinds cannot be planned on a decadal basis should not be uh, you know entities such as uh, nation states uh, survive for hundreds of years at least the planning has to be of that order uh, and food and water security are central to that and we cannot uh, ensure water security unless we in this case ensure river sustainability and river sustainability in turns is hinged on uh, 
as has been very well brought out by the eminent panel on so many things. My effort is to add that one little thing to the, the, the so many things, which is the strategic dimension uh, that the northeasterly neighbor will add uh, to this. Uh, today's technologies, I understand, uh, do give them a way out. Uh, though a lot more work needs to be done to see what will happen. Uh, they have declared in their five-year plan that uh, they would they, they would attempt. Uh, they also given assurances that the middle riparian concerns will be taken into account. Uh, and they have committed a reduction of 15% from uh, thermal uh, so a switch over to a switch over to Hyden. And the issue of water starvation. If we put all these elements together, then that one little element can be added to the river sustainability. And that river sustainability of Brahmaputra is absolutely critical uh, for India's water security, not just India's water security, but the regional water security, uh, including, of course, Tibet. Uh, and I would say that, you know, we, we need to factor this in to arrive at any sustainable proposition uh, for water security and for Brahmaputra. I think I should stop here. Uh, uh, there, there, there is something else that was planned, but uh, I, I, uh, my, my thanks to Arna for getting me in this and for you all to hear me out so patiently. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Definitely, the strategic dimension becomes very, very important. And I'm sure uh, the establishment is uh, sensitive to that. And uh, we together will continue to generate more information. And if at all we can complement the effort, uh, that will be a contribution that we can make together. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, our next speaker, the the last but one speaker uh, is Mr. Shripad Dharmadikari. Uh, it is, I have known him for a couple of years now, and I know he has deep insight into his domain. Uh, Mr. Dharmadikari, after his BTEC in mechanical engineering from IIT Bombay in 1985, and after working for a few years with industry, became a full time activist in the Narmada Bachao Andalan a mass movement of the people affected by large dams of the Narmada River. And in 2001, he relinquished full-time work of the NBA to set up Manthan Adhyan Kendra. And I think Manthan Adhyan Kendra has been contributing significantly to such efforts. And sir, we would like to hear from you. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, thank you, uh, uh, Arunabhji. Um, and of course, a very good evening to everybody. Um, I would I would like to start by saying that this has been an amazingly rich and uh, diverse uh, discussion. And in spite of sitting, uh, you know, for several hours, I think each one of us has been uh, rooted to the uh, screen and the, uh, you know, to the laptop or phone, whatever we are using. Um, so first of all, um, I want to thank you, uh, Dr. Arnab Das uh, and MRC for organizing this. Uh, very, very rich, very, very insightful discussion from a panel of very eminent and diverse speakers. Uh, and certainly I speak for myself personally, uh, but I'm sure I'm also speaking uh, on behalf of all the uh, participants here today uh, in, uh, you know, um, saying that this has been a very, very insightful and rich discussion. So uh, thank you once again from the behalf, from behalf of all of us. Now, uh, I have been asked to do some uh, what is called broadly as closing remarks and the way forward. Uh, again, by the very fact that this has been such a rich discussion and such a nuanced discussion, I would also add, I think it's very difficult to, to do any kind of summary or, you know, uh, any kind of uh, really um, trying to put together so many ideas that have come together as a part of the closing remarks. I won't be able to do justice to it. So I don't think I'm going to even attempt to do that kind of closing remarks. But what I will try to do is I just want to bring about three key points uh, from this whole uh, entire discussion as a kind of broad uh, key messages. 
and i'm uh, i'll try to do that in context of the second part of what i'm expected to do that is to talk about the way forward so i just want to be, bring three key messages from today's discussions as a uh, as a part of uh, thinking about the way forward and again my sincere apologies that i won't be able to even attempt to cover so many of the ideas that have been uh, brought about uh, so you know, let me uh, say that right up up front before i get into these three messages i just want to also uh, quickly start by uh, talking a bit about my own introduction to brahmaputra and to this whole region of the northeast how it has come about and uh, that is more to set the context of where i'm coming to in this discussion so um, my uh, kind of earliest uh, exposure and interaction with the whole brahmaputra system came from my work around the hydropower projects because of my work around the narmada dam i, I had uh, ha i've had a lot of interest in looking at energy and hydropower projects and when this host of uh, massive plants were laid out uh, laid out for development of the hydropower uh, projects in northeast i have uh, i had uh, got an interest in uh, in it and that's how my first introduction to the brahmaputra basin and the brahmaputra and the northeast has been i've been doing a fair bit of work around the, this whole scheme at the same time in the more recent years because we have been having a lot of uh, interest in uh, looking at rivers and all the kind of various interventions that are being done in the river systems through the country uh in the recent years a lot of our work has also focused on the inland water transport project the inland navigation project and of course we know that a lot of that is happening in the brahmaputra basin uh, and particularly also in the uh, ganga the national waterway one and through the uh, indo bangladesh protocol route into the uh, linking the national waterway one and the brahmaputra waterway so we have also been looking at the brahmaputra basin from that angle on that side one is in the headworks where you very the upper the hydropower projects are mainly in the upper reaches of the brahmaputra and the waterways are you know through the plains and in the lower regions so uh, this has been my exposure uh, and my work uh, in the brahmaputra related to the brahmaputra and you know uh, today's discussion for me highlights what has also been our concern when we have been looking either at the hydropower projects or the inland waterways that whatever way we are looking at the interventions in this river systems they have to be looked in the larger context of a variety of very diverse uh, context you know the social environmental technological uh, developments or the context so the context the framing of us looking at these interventions and and planning them looking at the policies looking at the actual implementation of the ground has to be seen in this very large very broad multifaceted multidimensional uh, framework i think that has always been our understanding when we have been looked at the intervention and today's discussion i think emphasizes this very much uh, so you know i want to highlight that and that brings me to the first message that i would like to draw from today's discussion and that message is that uh, you know the uh, the the very elements which for any region and particularly for the brahmaputra basin the very elements that promise uh, development and uh, livelihood opportunities and uh, you know employment opportunities to any region and particularly brahmaputra also bring with them the threats of risks to environment to the biodiversity and also bring with them a lot of concern about equity and i think that has been the message which has which we have seen uh, running through the entire set of discussions whether it was initially uh, the first kind of overarching address by uh, himanshu das ji who talked about uh, the concerns that the hydropower projects are bringing but who also talked a lot about the risks and dangers of the deforestation i think you know uh, that or whether we have uh, the issues which have been brought out by uh, you know uh, uh, dr arup mishra in terms of the the increasing risks and the threats of pollution which are coming out even though they may not be visible so i think or or uh, you know the the very important point which uh, dr anab das you yourself have talked about the degradation of the acoustic ecosystem so i think these are the threats which we need to be very very careful and conscious of 
as we talk about the development of the entire region using the resources like water and forest and all the other so i think that is the first key message that i would like to bring and just in relation to our own work around waterways i think one of the points that we have been trying to make or or which has come out uh, come to us in a very prominent way when we have been looking at the waterway development particularly uh, in the north uh, national waterway 1 brahmaputra and also sorry national waterway 1 in the ganga and national waterway 2 in the brahmaputra is that somehow there seems to be a a, a wrong emphasis you know whenever we look at the whole inland waterway project we are we are looking at you know there is the stock of large barges and big corporates 2000 3000 ton vessels large ports and terminals now we feel that this is you know yes this is normally the vision when we think of infrastructure but i think if we looking at particularly the brahmaputra basin the uh, the uh, and the uh, you know uh, indo uh, bangladesh protocol routes i think it is very important to actually shift the focus to the smaller users the smaller traders the smaller manufacturers the fisher people the smaller then the people who are running the smaller vessels the needs of the local communities i think it's very important uh, it was very important when uh, uh, you know uh, dr jain singh spoke about uh, the vision of bringing many roro uh, terminals you know pairs of roro terminals i think that that's an important element i think Uh, so you know uh, because it will be catering to the needs of the local communities and i think this um, this, uh, this this is very very important to uh, bring in and i think this is why i'm talking about this is the element of equity and for whom is the development the entire development planning to whose needs is it being uh, is it being planned whose needs will be catered to i think this is a central question uh you know and i think that is something which i want to emphasize and i think that is important so the environment are we threatening the very resources on which our development is going to be based that's one part of the question that we need to keep in mind i think it's a central message coming through today but also the message of equity and the need to prioritize the development for the most vulnerable sections of the people i think this is a very important message that comes through and i think when we talk about the way forward from this webinar i think uh, this is one thing i would like to lay uh, lay down for all of us to think about uh, and uh, the, of course the second uh, very very important message that ca- comes through this is climate climate change climate risk which i think uh, has been more accurately defined i think uh, professor anamika brua actually rightly pointed out that maybe we should think of it more in terms of climate risk rather than simply climate change and i would say unequivocally that climate risk is the central overarching influencer in the northeast and particularly in the brahmaputra basin uh, i mean it should be um, uh, uh, you know uh, so obvious that something uh, where in a region like the brahmaputra basin where water forest vegetation biodiversity is are the primary resources climate is going to be the big game changer right but unfortunately we have not looked at it uh, you know uh, my again uh, to come back to my own work around uh, the large dams you know we have the uh, we have these plans of massive uh, you know hydro power uh, uh, projects more than like a few hundred uh, planned in this uh, uh, in this region and when i was looking at these hydro power projects their dprs and the way their planning has been done one of the most shocking facts is that this planning has not uh, really even looked at what is going to happen to the this entire plan uh, in terms of climate change okay because what will happen when climate influences the water flows in the region uh, in terms of you know the entire vegetation the biodiversity how is it going to impact these hydropower projects both from the point of view of how will the climate change and its implication influence the performance of this project very very important we are putting in thousands of crores of rupees into this project so how will the performance be influenced but also on the other side uh, what does it mean in terms of the safety uh, risks to this dam what does it mean to the risk to the downstream communities to the upstream communities this was not factored in and now this, these questions become very very important for the hydropower projects particularly of course now because of our climate commitments we are saying we'll have more of these hydropower projects and of course the climate angle becomes very important but i think 
just not the hydropower projects, whether it is the siltation issue, whether it is the, uh, you know, the uh, water quality issue, whether it is the issue of the springs and groundwater, uh, any and everything, climate is the overarching influencer and we have not looked at it enough. Uh, so both in terms of understanding how the climate change and how the climate risk is going to impact and what we should do to mitigate and adapt to this risk. So I think that is the other, I think, very important message that is coming through. We need to focus very, very much on the whole climate. And again, I think as uh, Professor Barua talked about, not just the mitigation aspect, but also the adaptation. And how do we look at vulnerabilities of the climate? So I think this is the uh, second important message that I would like to draw out from this uh, discussion today for looking at the way forward. And uh, because we have not looked at climate, you know, uh, it sort of exposes our gap in knowledge and understanding, which is the third very, very important uh, message, which has been again highlighted by several speakers today. Uh, and I think uh, what I would say has been articulated very aptly again as that the Brahmaputra River Basin is heavily under researched, you know, and um, therefore, uh, conversely, it talks about the need to bring together that research and i think we have also seen some of the key elements which are under researched uh, of course the climate impact of course itself but i think uh, what professor what dr himanshu kulkarni talked about that the uh, the groundwater both the kind of springs or the the role the groundwater is playing or the if the spring is at least the visible part of the groundwater but the subterranean groundwater we don't know so much about it and of course, I think very, very important uh, with what we started today, the whole, uh, you know, uh, underwater, uh, uh, underwater domain, uh, uh, you know, that uh, uh, framework, very, very critical. Again, just to come back to uh, our own work on the uh, inland waterways, I think one of the big uh, aspects, which of course, uh, uh, Dr. Adab Das has also highlighted, uh, the, one of the big impacts that the uh, inland navigation has is on the underground noise uh, environment and again we need uh, something like the um, you know uh, the underwater domain assessment framework which is again a big gap in our knowledge uh, these are only some of the key things of course there are many aspects on which much larger studies needs to be done the socio cultural understanding uh, and all that and i think uh, how to address that would be an important part of the discussion going further and i think uh, different thoughts have come about it whether there is a need for a center or there is a need for more collaborative efforts of a network of researchers which need to not just be limited to researchers but which need to bring in the community knowledge also in it i think these are some of the very important uh, thoughts which have come so therefore i think some of the ideas which have been talked about the center of uh, excellence in uh, uh, in uh, inland water transport, very, very important. But I think uh, it is one aspect that would much more need to be done. And I think we can uh, together talk about it. And uh, I think the important part would be not only to look at these key elements, which are gaps, but how to integrate them together into a more broader understanding of the Brahmaputra Basin, a broader understanding of the interventions in the basin and what those implications of those basins are. So I think this is the third very, very important uh, message uh, i think that i would like to kind of distill from today's um, today's discussion and i think uh, these are the kind of things which uh, would be important when we think about the way forward and uh, lastly i would say that i'm also very glad uh, that earlier itself uh, dr das had talked about that this is not uh, the last of the discussions but rather the first of the discussions and you have uh, at least five more webinars lined uh, up to talk about uh, many different aspects of the Brahmaputra Basin. So I'm sure that some of these ideas about how to go forward in a very meaningful way would be taken up uh, in those uh, webinars. So I'm thankful to you for not only organizing this webinar, but I think for promising us that we are going to have at least five more of this and an and a, uh, ongoing process uh, in the coming days. So thank you very much uh, for this and thank uh, to everybody else. Uh, Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. I don't think anybody could have done this job better than you, uh, <coughs> putting it uh, so very uh, in a nuanced manner. Thank you so much. I think uh, before I hand over to Ana, uh, Ananya, I would like to call uh, Captain Sudhir Subedar, sir, for a very quick, I think, two minutes uh, intervention 
uh, he has been uh, instrumental in drafting the uh, Assam Indian Water Transport Act also and somebody who understands shipping very, very well. Uh, so with that, sir, your intervention. This is the last, I promise. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I have been sending some chats as the presentations were going on, uh, Arnab. Uh, I'm looking forward to the series of webinars on this very important topic that you have put together. Uh, we will work together on uh, continue to work together on these on this issue. I would definitely like to make this intervention that IWT in India is inevitable. And with due respect to the panelists. Uh, the river of hope and sorrow, I would rather say that it is a river of hope and we need to get on with the work that is required to be done in Gohati as we speak and at Varanasi also as we speak because most of the work is still pending. I come from a background of shipping and inland water transport having transported 600 ton, 6 meter wide reactor in 1986 on the, on the eve of Paraka Barrage opening. And I'm sad to say that very little has changed from Haldia to Palabab. And there is need to fast track this process of inland water transport integrating into the India's transport policy. Even C. Ganga has recognized that river water is for navigation and we need to begin to develop our rivers, at least the five rivers which were originally national waterways to the levels of Rhine and Mississippi in the next few years. Thank you, Arnab. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, and now the last, uh, I would request Ananya. She is uh, going to be driving our Brahmaputra uh, research and coordinate all the activities. And uh, she is already doing a lot of good work in understanding uh, what has been done and how we can take things forward. So, Ananya, over to you, the last word. Thank you so much, sir, for your kind words. And good evening, everyone, to one and all present here. Our honorable speakers, respected directors, uh, Arnab, sir, and all the participants. It's such an honor for me to get this opportunity to thank all the uh, people who have came here and joined us today on behalf of Marine, uh, Maritime Research Center. And I extend a warm welcome to all the people in this e-gathering. Uh, I would like to express my gratitude to all the esteemed delegates for the webinar and for their presence and contribution to make this a webinar a great dialogue through your thought provoking, enlightening and insightful discussions along with your shared views and expertise in the domain. This framework is uh, fairly new and it's very motivating for youth like us seeing so many experts coming together and uh, giving us so much uh, insightful and motivating use to work more on it. And uh, thank you for inspiring and in encouraging us all always. Uh, wishing you everyone a very good health amidst this pandemic and a very good day. Thank you. Thank you, Anamika. Thank you all. I think it's sometimes a little scary, you know, there is so much to be done. So I think all of us needs to come together and uh, whatever little we can all contribute. Uh, I think we must come together. Thank you so much uh, for a good start. And we look forward to your continued support. And uh, 5th of February, please keep uh, mark the date. And we would like to meet all of you again. Thank you very much.